what the hell is going on? Great result about that under-17 World Cup, by the way. I mean, uh, can you believe it? We actually won a title. Isn't that amazing? No. Is that... <laughs> I pressed that last week. That took ages to appear. Does that give us a little bit of hope for the future of our game? Negative. No, not really, no. We'll find a way to take that raw talent and turn it into sludge. It was a tremendous result. 5-2. Oh, spoiler alert. It was 5-2. And before we get carried away, I looked it up. The previous five times that the Under-17 World Cup was held, and they held it uh, about every other year, Nigeria won it three times out of five. Nigeria. And the other two times it was Mexico and Switzerland. I mean, they aren't exactly Germany in the world football rankings. It doesn't seem to make any difference whatsoever. Isn't that weird? Nigeria won it three times since 2007, and they're still 41st in the adult FIFA rankings. And if you do the uh, mathematics, I'm going to do mental arithmetic in my mind. Oh, no! Those 17-year-olds from 2007 are now are fully old enough to retire. So it hasn't made the slightest bit of difference. How weird. So let's not get carried away, but, uh, you know, congratulations anyway. Well done, lads. We actually won something. Hallelujah. I am stunned. The, uh, let's do the, the weather and get that out of the way, and then uh, we can um, a bitch and moan and whine about the fact that the clocks are going back again tonight. Damn it. Every year this comes around, and every single year we have the exact same conversation. Why, oh, why, oh, why? And it looks like a real autumn is coming at us this weekend. The uh, first widespread frost is going to be appearing across the country. Sunday night, temperatures are going to plummet. Many people are waking up on, with frost on the ground on Monday morning. And parts of Scotland are going to get down to minus four. It's like instant winter. Uh, Greg, the uh, forecaster from the Met Office, has said the first widespread frost in the UK this autumn is coming this weekend. We could be seeing the coldest night of the season so far. London and the South East, temperatures in single digits. So Sunday, a cloudy day. Average temperature of around 15. Dipping uh, overnight to, uh, like I said, about minus four in uh, some parts of Scotland. Awful, awful, awful. And um, dark. Dark from now until uh, well, until until the weather gets nice again, which should be uh, only another nine short months from now. Oh, I can't stand it. So you've read some of this stuff about uh, Spain, and it's hard to uh, really get your head around how much uh, they appear to uh, hate each other. Never mind about anybody else. Countries can't get along with themselves. And so the Madrid government now has decided to impose a direct rule over Catalonia. And within minutes, insults were flying, opposing sides accusing each other of totalitar to to totalitarianism. Seven syllables! Totalitarianism and rebellion. And the longer that the Barcelona-Madrid struggle rages, the more entrenched the opposing sides become and the greater the potential for its destabilising effects to send political and economic shockwaves across Europe, says The Guardian, which doesn't sound positive at all. And they're going to stir up comparable, uh, dormant or long-simmering independence or separatist sentiments. And you know what? Those sentiments are everywhere. I mean, just look at this country alone. Cornwall wants to be a separate entity from Britain. Cornwall. They want autonomy. What are they going to do for money? They want independence and they want to burn down restaurants owned by rich English television chefs. Some of them do. Yorkshire's plotting devolution. They want own rule and control of their budget. All that pudding money. And then there's Scotland, of course, who have been so upset at the English since the dawn of time. And the Welsh want greater autonomy. And over there, the Belgians are so upset with other Belgians, they've forgotten that you don't put mayonnaise on chips. Those Walloonies. And Bosnia hates Herzegovina, Herzegovina, Kavina. And the Istrians hate the Croats, and the Moravians hate the Czechs, and the Faroese hate the Danish, and everybody hates the French. Actually, that's not far off. The French are so split, I'm surprised they haven't declared war on themselves. There's the Basques and the Corsicans and the Provencals and the... Well, the, and don't, don't even get me started on the Alsatians. 
and none of them can stand the beret wearing uh, cheese eating sight of each other all of this seems to have um, uh, just to snuck up on us we thought that we were getting along so peacefully and nice and everyone was all hugger mugger and being charming to each other and the reverse is true couldn't be more wrong and in Germany the Bavarians hate the trains not running on time and in Italy the Sicilians hate the Sardinians and the Venetians hate absolutely everyone especially tourists and with good reason it's not Venice land and it's not Disney World it's an actual working city that looks like an 18th century painting so where does this end whatever happened to peace love and understanding and who are the people that are part of the problem I'm a nutcase mentioning no names does anybody spring to mind um anybody at all <sighs> if you can explain any of this to me then I'm uh, all ears of course it might be the Russians and we've got to peek into a troll farm you know that you've uh, heard much about the Russian uh, troll farms and uh, how they um, uh, engineered it for uh, you know who to win uh, you know what you are going to love President Trump well the uh, International Business Times reported uh, a former employee um, a former empl I can't speak tonight a former employee I should do the uh, mouth the warming up things that uh, the actors and singers do <laughs> wow, wow a former employee of a Russian troll farm so, so, yes, it's priceless. said that a Hillary Clinton look-alike and a black man were hired by the company to create a fake sex tape during the 2016 uh, general election the election in the States <laughs> during the race to the White House the now infamous Russian troll farm used social media and ran websites to promote tr pro-Trump stories particularly divisive ideas and misinformation to sow discord in the US misinformation as in fake news the Kremlin linked group bought ads on Facebook and ran popular Twitter accounts some of which were retweeted by Trump's campaign officials and uh, the uh, CEO of Twitter itself this is the first employee to go on record from uh, one of these Russian troll farms which also have been accused of uh, you know uh, bringing us uh, brexit the arguments that UKIP stands for aren't valid but were repeated over and over again on social media and this Kremlin linked group uh, bought ads on Facebook ran popular Twitter accounts um, the first employee to go on record is a bloke called Alan uh, Baskayev and he told uh, an independent Russian television channel of his experiences working the night shift at the troll factory <laughs> trolls used to be a uh, a, a small a hairy uh, t a, t a toy that children were delighted with now there's something else entirely they're bringing about the end of the world as we know it and he worked for this so-called troll farm between November 2014 and April uh, 2015 which is plenty enough time to figure out what they were up to and he wrote posts on political forums and impersonated uh, what he called Kentucky rednecks and African Americans online because not only were they um, trying to persuade the uh, the, the uh, rednecks I'll, I'll just call them that because that's, that phrase has already come up the rednecks in America to uh, support Donald Trump but they, they were also taking the opposite side essentially just trying to get everybody to hate each other and start exchanging a gunfire with great success it was really easy uh, he said uh, there's this meme about the troll factory people sitting in black caps and masks and behind them there's a photo of uh, Vladimir Putin and a Russian flag he said I don't know what happened on the day shift but the night shift it was a bacchanal we did the most ridiculous things we could think of and that's the problem with the internet everybody sees it uh, on the world wide way and they think oh yeah that's uh, the, yeah that's that's probably true yeah we didn't go to the moon <laughs> he said his bosses thought they hit the sensation jackpot with a fake video of a black man and a woman who looked like Hillary Clinton having sex what? he said another propaganda video uh, made to showed an african-american soldier shooting a copy of the Quran just in order to get uh, the, uh, all of America riled up and screaming at each other 
like I said, with tremendous success. It may be the most successful business that's ever been uh, created. The results they've had. U.S. intelligence agencies concluded in January of this year that uh, Root and Toot and Shoot and Putin ordered a complex influence campaign which included cyber attacks, leaks, a misinformation campaign, fake news and more to hurt Hillary Clinton's chances and help uh, Donald Trump win the election. Donald Trump is the leader of the free world. Can you believe that? No. It is just <laughs> remarkable. It's like we're living through... Um, I don't know, a, a nightmare or a dream, depending on your position. Facebook sold $100,000 worth of politically divisive ads to inauthentic accounts created by this Russian troll farm. The best $100,000 that um, uh, anybody has probably ever spent. I mean, that's peanuts as far as advertising is concerned. And yet they took uh, that, uh, or the people, people looking at uh, the internet, took that $100,000 worth of ads and just repeated it uh, ad infinitum until hundreds of millions of people were reached. This is the best a advertising spending money ever. And it was reported that Russian operatives used the site to remotely organize anti-immigrant protests because they're coming over here. And they also organized the pro-Trump rallies. You know, the uh, Make America Great Again, the Yeehaw uh, uh, rallies in the Dingling States. <laughs> That's not uh, an insulting thing to say, is it? No. Okay, good. Twitter said it discovered 201 Russian accounts on its platform that were connected to, to the Facebook ads. Are you know Russia today? <coughs> Excuse me. Hang on, I'm going to cough. That's better. <laughs> Russia Today, the, uh, the Kremlin-backed uh, uh, television uh, news channel, it's, it was all the way up the dial where uh, Fox News used to be until they took it off. I'm kind of disappointed that they took Fox News off because it was um, it's, it's like this multicolored. Um, it was just the most bizarre news channel you've ever seen. Now you can't see it anymore. Oh, well, never mind. Anyway, it was right up, uh, up your satellite dial, but it ain't there no more. But I think Russia Today is still there. And um, Russia Today bought uh, about a quarter of a million dollars worth of ads on Twitter last year. And um, Russian operatives also spent tens of thousands of dollars on uh, Google and YouTube, YouTube and Gmail and uh, Google search. But nothing at all on Bing. <laughs> uh, uh, what's his name? Jamie Oliver. Uh, Oliver, that... Um, the British talk show host in America, something Oliver. Anyway, he made the, he cracked a great joke that um, Bing, it's the best way to Google something. Nobody, nobody uses Bing. But anyway, they didn't spend any money on that. Good thing too. U.S. lawmakers are, um, on the first of November, which sounds like a couple of days to me, are going to grill executives from Facebook and Twitter and Google. Maybe they'll even buy a suit for the occasion. I think they should grill them and put them straight in jail. I mean, look at what they've done. You are going to love President Trump. Not so far. But there's the most fantastic letter that Donald Trump has supposedly wrote about himself and his attractiveness to women. And that's the surface, uh, courtesy of a magazine called uh, 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 New, New York. I'll come to that in a while as well. It's just <laughs> it's absolutely priceless. Nobody knows who the hell he is! I'm a bit discombobulated because I've lost my pointer thing, which um, I use to uh, hit the screen to make it, uh, you know, burst into action. I'm having to do it with my finger! Disgusting! Exactly. I feel, uh, dirty. Here's a call in... South End. Chris. Uh, good evening, hello. Um, I just wanted as well, you, uh, one thing I've noticed during your show is that sometimes the lights go out in your studio you know yes, you they do. Play your hands mm -hmm. and yeah. that. well could you not just get them to put all the sensor and just sort of put them on permanently i mean can you have a word with your you know your, 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 can you not have a, your, <laughs> a word with your set designer or something well do you think that i haven't asked that i have specifically requested that and apparently it is impossible it is beyond the wit of human man and uh, or, oh. or women 
We checked both sexes and neither of them could do anything about it. We can land a man on the moon, but we can't keep our lights on for more than 30 minutes. <laughs> Actually, it's 35. If I don't get up and walk around during the news every 30 minutes, then five minutes after the news, I'm plunged into darkness. And often I'll just forget, you know, so wrapped up in this super show. Uh, and also, have you ever thought of doing a lot of Facebook live then? Because like, I noticed James O'Brien and Nick Farai, you, you can like see them on Facebook. Or, yeah. or even, your, even your good mate Nigel Farai, mm. you, you can see him live. Well, we have an enormous, um, uh, uh, highly uh, technical uh, facility downstairs where the, uh, you know, where the grown-ups come from. But I'm in a broom cupboard upstairs because it's apparently also impossible <laughs> to fire off your own sound effects. <laughs> in the uh, in the big studio that looks like the starship enterprise it's fabulous down there i've never i've never presented a single show from in there because um I, it's, I, you can't fire off your own sound effects apparently oh, that's in, it's yeah. impossible to do yeah we can't it cannot be done so it's simply because the sound effects are shame that you can't move down there. Oh, yeah well, okay because oh, well I, I also self-op I'm operating myself uh, at this moment, and uh, you know the big uh, the the star names have other people do all of that to menial stuff for them. You know, there's a whole oh, there's a whole right. phalanx of people through the screen who are uh, you, you know I've got no idea what they do, but they're doing it um, furiously and tremendously well. I, on the other hand, am uh, uh, you know I'm doing it uh, myself. It's just me. Well, 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 listen, I think you do a good job then, Nick, anyway. But the thing is, I was going to say, you, you know you mentioned earlier that the England under-18s or under-18s? Under-17s. Under under yeah, you know yeah, what the average 17. age of the under-17 team is? <laughs> 16. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I... I looked this up uh, a while ago for um, from an another tournament, and the average age of the under seventeen team was eighteen. <laughs> if you believe that, apparently it's when the uh, when the thing starts, they all have to be under seventeen. But as it goes on for a year or more, they're all eighteen or nineteen by the time the under seventeen tournament is decided. And I bet that's the case here. I bet they're all um, uh, like eighteen, nineteen years old now. Those under seventeens. Well, well, possibly. But the thing is, on the England national team, look, I appreciate this isn't talk sport, but I, I honestly just... I, 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 I said this the other day, because, you know, obviously next year we've got the World Cup in Russia where the, the yeah. big boys, the, the, the senior England team, mm. are going to. Well, yeah. I honestly would have preferred it if Scotland had gone instead. <laughs> of I, I would have, honestly... Well, at least we would have expected them to, um, to, I don't know, can you say disappointed in this regard? But we're going to be disappointed because we're, our hopes are going to be raised. Yes, yes, they will. Yes, they will. Our hopes are going to be raised and we will uh, be um, uh, overcome with the uh, emotion of it all. And we think that this time we're finally going to do it. And we'll uh, have a tremendous result in the first game, and then we'll get hammered by Swaziland or, or somewhere like that. Or, or some say, I, mean, I mean, the thing is, what's amazing is that Iceland, a, a country with, hmm. with the population of six. Wigan, yeah, six. That, you know, Iceland, the country with the population of Wigan, yeah. could put together a team that can qualify for the World Cup. They top their group, but yet we've got. A population of sixty-five million, and, and, I, I, and I and I can't wait. By the way, for the for whoever it is who c c picks the short straw and has to commentate on the Iceland game, because you see, if you see the names of the people who make oh, up that know, team, there isn't a single one of them that doesn't have thirty-six syllables in their name. It's all Sigurdsmonsvir. Sigurdsson, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Bug Yeah. yeah. Well, as I say, I, I have been to Iceland. Actually, it's a very, very. Um, interesting country is it? Basically. how did I mean, they appear when you were there because apparently in iceland there's uh they're, they're very upset with the amount of tourists they've got they're being overrun uh, by tourists you yeah, never well, mind well, about the venetians uh, uh, complaining stop whining about the amount of tourists <laughs> that go to venice and with good reason because uh, there's there's you can't see venice for tourists in any one in any one moment almost half of the pictures being taken on earth are being taken in venice well the, the, well, the thing is, look, I mean, Iceland's an interesting case because I think that um, I went, I think, about two or three years after their big financial crash happened. Yeah. And I think at the, at, that, at the time I went, they were quite welcoming to tourists. But what I would say is that the Icelandic people, just like probably a lot of people in the Nordic region, dare I say, are quite kind of reserved and tend to sort of keep themselves to themselves. Mm. But I think what... Now, what, do you mean what, sexually? 
<laughs> because they all appear to be, uh, you know, six foot and blonde like the uh, the Danes and the uh, the Swedish. You know, all those super perfect people, and um, they they don't seem to. Um, maybe it's just me. They don't seem to uh, make themselves available to uh, the stunted runts from this country. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's just me. Well, well, but, well, well, the thing is, my friend actually was school. He, I mean, he, he's actually married to a Swedish person, so there's obviously hope for some of us. Anyway. I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> but, but the thing is, though, the, uh, the other thing I want to talk to you about as well, Nick, is that, look, that, you know, that it, it seems every once in a while, every once a fortnight, once a week, whatever, a politician seems to have said something on Twitter in the past inappropriately or made a joke that didn't go down well. Yeah. And I just wonder, perhaps, Nick, and this might not be a popular view, but I just want to, you know, do we expect too much of our politicians to a large extent? Yes, yes, we do. Well, on the one hand, we want them to be real human beings, and we're forever complaining that they are career politicians and they don't have any experience yeah, of the world. Exactly, but, on, yeah. but on the other, we don't want them to be human beings at all. We want them to be robots. Correct. With no emotion or feeling, or um, and especially no feeling. No feeling in the uh, Palace of Westminster. Uh, no, I'll tell you what, the, when, the, when the lid blows off that scandal, people are, oh. ru are rushing around furiously trying to put the lid back on that scandal, but if it does blow off, then uh, grip onto something firm. And Well, uh, let me put it another way. Grip onto oh, something oh. Um, solid, uh, uh, because, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a bumpy ride. Oh, oh, it probably will be. It'd be interesting to see how it pans out. But, but what amazed me is if you go, you know, comparing cultures, if you look at, say, France, which is only just literally over the, the English Channel, um, that their former president Hollande, he cheated on his wife, which is, yeah, you know, which over here would be a massive scandal. But yet the French people didn't well, he married his he guy. married his teacher. No, 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 you're thinking Macron. Macron. Oh, Macron. who did you say? No, I was all about the former president Hollande. Oh, Hollande, Hollande. right? Yeah, you, you see, he cheated on his wife. Yeah. But yet it was. Hard. I think, I think that's. Is it, I think it's obligatory for a French politician, isn't it? I mean, that's the uh, that's the least that they could get away with, and still maintain <laughs> Frenchness. But but, but you bet is like, if that happened in our country. Oh, blimey, you'd never it, hear the end of it. Up, you wouldn't hear the end of it. But the thing is, though, you see, the French people weren't bothered about it because no. they all said, well, as long as he does his job as an MP. Who cares what he gets? Yeah, they they gave a, a gallic shrug of the shoulders and they said, as with one voice. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of it. Hey, Chris, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, leave it there, but thanks a lot. Texts or tweets or uh, emails. All of these small areas chasing independence is nothing but an expression of hashtag parochial rebellion by the hopelessly overwhelmed. I have no idea what that means. What does that mean? The hopelessly overwhelmed. You mean the people for whom the, um, the, the modern world is um, not... Uh, uh, they don't feel that they've benefited from globalization you mean those people uh, uh but we haven't benefited from globalization of course we have do you like um apples in the summertime that's globalization do you like uh, strawberries in winter globalization do you like a packet of uh, three t-shirts for a fiver globalization it's benefited almost everybody or pr practically everybody i mean there's a massive shift from uh an agrarian uh, life of abject poverty in China to um, uh, uh, living a life of abject poverty in Chinese cities. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Uh, that's just as a for instance. And everybody in this country has benefited, whether or not that you will live for the lifestyle of a Kardashian. I mean, I know that we have access to images of other people's fabulous wealth more now than we ever have. But, uh, you know, it's like winning the, winning the lottery. I mean, it is literally like winning the lottery. All those people are only in that position because of luck. Just remember that. And you're, and you're not in that position also because of luck or lack of it. Uh, Pete says, we have auto shut-off sensors in work that can switch the lights off. The sensors in my workplace can be overcome by placing a rubber glove over it. The sensor reflects back on itself and fools itself into thinking something is constantly moving. <laughs> huh. But what if the sensor is flush to the ceiling? I'd have to glue it there. I'm sure they wouldn't be pleased with that. Stanwell Moore, uh, Nicholas. Good evening, Mr. Abbott. Yes, sir. Uh, 
You've been speaking earlier about the Russian troll farm having yeah. done exceptionally well, particularly with uh, the American elections. Mm -hmm. um, so I would uh, put forward the idea that we ask them to intervene with running our railway system. <laughs> they could fire all of the drivers on Southern, just as starters. Well, there are five uh, companies going on strike on the 8th and 9th of November, and currently our uh, Minister of Rednecks and Transport, Mr. Grayling, uh, hasn't done terribly well, um, either in his present role or indeed in his previous ministerial career, whether he's suffering... But what, could he, but what could he actually have done, though? I mean, if the drivers are determined to hold back the, uh, the, the tide of time to... To prevent the to try to prevent robots taking their jobs which i believe is my, if that's my belief about what this is all about it's not actually health and safety that's to me that looks like a smoke screen it's actually about to trying to prevent the robots from taking their jobs so, well at the, so, end piece, at the end piece i suggest that they're probably trying to make more money for themselves and their shareholders rather than uh, you know safety they're not interested in safety but just in making more money well, you mean uh, the, the, the companies who own the, uh, the correct. franchise? Correct. Well, I mean, they are interested in health and safety. Uh, they can't be, they, they can't completely ignore that. But being a private enterprise, I'm sure that um, like, I mean, if, if, you, we, if you, we were running it, I'm sure we would have an eye on the bottom line ourselves. We would, but I you know, would suggest that possibly uh, health and safety would come slightly higher up. Uh, well, yeah, but... Uh, well, um, uh, it's up. You, you ask any company, and they'll say that it's paramount. I mean, partly because they don't want to get sued for any um, uh, any um, you know failing on their part. But there's there's no evidence to suggest that a tra that a driverless train is any less safe than a non-driverless one. I mean, we've got driverless trains I, I would disagree all over this country. Disagree absolutely. Well, on, that on makes you that makes you wrong then. <laughs> uh, well, that's debatable possible but debatable i was on an underground train going uh on the i, I can't remember which uh, line it was yeah, going it up matter. to towards baker street oh yes um probably the baker loo uh, line no it wasn't oh, i better got that right <laughs> it wasn't the baker loo anyway uh we were traveling along and then we judded to a hall oh no nothing happened and then the driver came on to the tannoy mm. Uh, saying that there was a problem with the, the signals, that he was going to have to manually go through red signals. Yeah. What He explained what would happen normally had he tried to go through a red signal, the train would automatically judder to an abrupt halt. Yes. So he warned all the passengers mm -hmm. that this was going to happen yeah. and that we should cling on for dear life. Right. Now, I've been on, one of, uh, on a train that's done that. Right? Yeah. Now, if you have a robot in charge of the train yeah. would that happen sufficiently given yeah of course g uh, hang on given <laughs> it would have to be run by computers I jumped the gun there didn't i you did i fear <laughs> what would happen if it was run by computers mm. and we know what happens with computers mr putin and other countries try and take over and disrupt computers well then they wouldn't be connected to the internet it'd be connected to an intranet that doesn't work, though, because they have problems with the signalling system that is also on the intranet that is also has been sabotaged. No, it hasn't. Yes, it has. Who by? They don't know. <laughs> they, I bet it was they, that, I bet it was that blooming Putin again, wasn't it? He's been at it. Oh, come off it, mate. Of course it will. I mean, th this is the same kind of thinking that will prevent um, robot cars from uh, taking over. Affirmative. And robot cars will be absolutely safer than the uh, situation that we have at the moment when cars are driven by um, stupid mouth-breathing, knuckle-dragging meat sacks. No offence. So you would, you would go in a, a robot-driven car? Oh, in an instant. Mm. I can't wait till they take over. You know how many uh, people die on Britain's roads because of uh, user error? Negative. Uh, well, I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh. But it, it's uh, it's something of the order of uh, uh, like a thousand a week. I mean, it's just an absolutely staggering amount. And it's higher, obviously, than the robot-driven cars currently. The problem with robot-driven cars is when they come. Well, there's two problems. When they come in, they will have uh, to um, negotiate the roads, uh, which are being driven most mostly um, or being driven on mostly by people and people do not respect the rules of the road, whereas robot cars will. Mm -hmm. And the second problem is any uh, difficulty that they encounter 
will um, give fuel to the fire of people that say, oh, well, it doesn't work. And we must go back to the, uh, the current position, which is people driving cars, which don't work. And pedestrians. They have to deal with the, the robot cars. Yeah, pedestrians and... Pedestrian um, people um, looking at their, their uh, mobile telephones. Uh, yeah, all of that, yeah. Computers will be able to do that much more, uh, uh, much more easily and more efficiently and safer than people. Same with driving trains, back to what we were talking about. So the answer then would appear to ha be have a computer organise the rail system completely. Well, it does, doesn't it? Well, no, it's Mr. Grayling is, uh, is <laughs> replacing with a robot. Well, you know, that would be a good idea. That would be a good start. At least we can agree on that. Excellent. Chris Grayling gets replaced by uh, Arnold de Schwarzenegger. Hands up, who's with me? Correct. Yeah. Sounded like a call from uh, 1944. Tatty boy, are they really going on strike again? I mean, what exactly do they want? How much money is enough? They have to be the highest paid unskilled um, uh, uh, workers on earth. That's right, I said it, unskilled. You could learn how to drive a train in about 10 seconds flat. Just s sit down, open a book and push a lever. That's it, as far as I can tell. Unless I'm getting any of this wrong, in which case you can correct me. But uh, what are they going? It's like fifty, sixty, seventy thousand pound a year for doing what, what looks to, to the um, uh, to the, um, the the outside observer as absolutely nothing whatsoever. It doesn't have anything to do with safety. Uh, I read a report the other day that said um, uh, within a relatively short period of time, computers are going to have an IQ of uh, thou in the thousands. They're going to be so much smarter than us. And it's all happening incredibly quickly. We're at the foothills of the artificial intelligence um, revolution. We haven't even started yet. That vastly powerful computing device in your pocket is, um, is going to be laughed at for its um, inadequacy in a few years' time. And it has more computing power, your phone does, than they used to put a man on the moon. It's uh, increasing exponentially, the power of uh, computers, and pretty soon uh, computers will uh, take one uh, look at uh, us uh, inefficient human beings and decide <laughs> that uh, they don't need us anymore, no mind about the other way around. Uh, we're, we're going to be um, uh, their sex bots. Graham says, it's hardly surprising people are taken in by the internet. They're so addicted they'll believe anything. By the way, trolls are real creatures who hide under bridges to stop Billy Goat from crossing rivers. I don't know how they get into computers, though. No, it's a mystery. Or as Toy used to say, it's a mystery. Somebody remind me to do the, the letter that to Donald Trump wrote, because that's absolutely priceless. The stuff we're finding out about uh, Donald Trump, and, uh, and, and none of it is in, is in any way surprising. He wrote a letter about himself and signed it. Um, this is the, the allegation. And I believe it 100%. He wrote a letter signed it um, his secretary, a person that uh, people have looked for and do doesn't exist, to describe uh, Donald Trump's uh, attractiveness to the opposite sex. <laughs> he wrote it himself. <laughs> it's priceless. So I'll come to that. Um, also, the uh, whole Russia thing might blow up on Monday. And, um, oh, there's plenty else to talk about. Don't you worry about that. Think you're talking to? I'm talking to a fellow in Ipswich called Steve. Steve. Hello, young man. You and me might just fall out shortly. Oh no. I hope that doesn't happen, Steve. I'm sure it won't, because we're big and grown up and everything. Yes. So uh, I've literally got in the car, heard the last. Now wait a minute, Steve. Said. You're not driving, are you? Oh, I'm not driving. I have specifically stopped, oh, pumped up, to excellent. Off. Just Very well done. You. Okay. Good I work. I was motivated by what you were saying about us horrendous train drivers. Oh, yes. And now, are you one of these fellas that's going on strike soon? I'm not going on strike. I work in a part of the country where the train drivers are not in, in dispute currently. Um, but... But why, yeah. why is that? Why are some in dispute and others aren't? Well, one of the uh, things about the uh, split up of the railway is that when you have a nationalised railway, if you have a strike in Scotland, it's very easy to spread that across the entire country. Mm. And I suspect the government very much of the day, back in the day when they changed it, 
um, were aware of that. And uh, something in Dumfries and Galloway could all of a sudden stop trains going in and out of London. Yeah. And so the train set got split up into lots of different portions. I think it's about 27. And that means that if you have a dispute on one particular company, that's a dispute between the staff and that employer. That's about, about the only, would, yeah, it's about one of the only good things that came out of the splitting up of uh, the old British Rail. Well, I think it's, that's, that's not, there, there are merits in one way and the other. And as a driver, I would say that um, I, I personally feel, I certainly absolutely and categorically do not speak for any trade union or any group of drivers. I'm speaking purely as a personal view. But my view is I think we've done okay at privatisation because there was a shortage of drivers and in any shortage there is, uh, recognition of that and it comes on the basis of a salary um, yeah done okay you you've uh, made out like bandits you train drivers there there can't be gosh. another comparable job on earth that's paid as well as you guys i mean driving a bus is much more difficult because it's not on rails for a start you decide which way the bus goes whereas in a train you just push a lever and the, and the rails take control right well, if I could swing it with my managers, I would love to, to invite you to come up and play trains for a day and see exactly what levels of skills are involved in stopping anything up to a thousand tons worth of train in a window of platform that is maybe four foot long because you've got to stop in the right place because that's where the monitors are. Different trains have different braking characteristics. Even yeah, but you could say one. yeah, you could say that about buses or cars. I mean, once you've learnt it, then uh, you, it's just automatic. So it would be much better if uh, an actual that way. if an that's actual com if an actual computer were taking it. I mean, you can't tell me that a computer couldn't stop a train on a sixpence. I'm sure it could. Yeah. I'm sure it could. If you wanted to invest the amount of money required to um, to buy a brand new train set and all of the infrastructure that you would need to change to do that, the vast and massive costs involved would yeah, be... But, but, uh, how much does it cost when train drivers go on strike and uh, London is ground to a standstill? I mean, I, well, I, I, the, the num numbers... To standstill. Let's be honest about it. Let's be honest and let's be proportionate. The, the number of different rail operators running into London is going to mean that the London's not going to run to a standstill. Well, but okay, no, okay, massively, the people are massively inconvenienced, and so they don't go to the shops and buy what they were going to buy, so, so shops to lose their, you know, that to retail sure. income, and sure. people I don't go to work, that. and they don't uh, make okay. deals, and people lose their jobs, and, you know, all the rest of it. Strikes it's massively expensive. Sure. All, all the government would have to do is to invest a uh, one time in a in a, a robot that f figures it all out uh, at probably huge cost but they'd make that back within uh, well i don't know in a, a short period of time considering well, that fun. robots work 24 hours a day uh, without um, without a fault they, they don't ask for extra time on uh, christmas day they don't get mm -hmm. drunk and uh, call in uh, sick and the, and um, <laughs> and they don't go on strike okay well let's let's, let's Put, put a little re realism into this equation and I'll do this from a personal perspective. In the 20 years that I've driven trains four people have gone under my trains. Yeah. At that point I've got stuff to do. I've got to do it right. I've got to do it properly and I've got a lot of people to look after. I've got to contact the signals. I've got to contact control. I've got to liaise with my untrained staff if there are any, because we've got this driver-only scenario. I've got to ensure the safety of other trains. Steve, no, no, none of what you've just described could could right be done there, could, right. could not be done by a computer. Okay, so there you are in the middle of nowhere with your uh, train that's just been involved in a tragic incident. Mm. Who's going to step up and make sure things happen? Happen. Who's going to be securing? Who's going to be securing the local area? Who's going to be making sure the safety of everyone on that Steve, train? Steve, you on your it. own are going to secure the local area. How are you going to do that? You the, emer the emergency there's... services will be speeding you... to the scene. Don't worry about it, Steve. You'll, you'll be. Uh, you, you'll be. The, the computer will call them. It'll all happen automatically. Holy That's smoke! Nice. If computers can can uh, can uh, launch rockets into the air and and land it on uh, somebody from uh, ISIS, 
with uh, an accuracy of uh, about an inch. They can certainly call up Someone, control when uh, when they that's, run that's, over somebody on a rail. You're, 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 you're coming up with a spear of compassion. You know damn well that, that, that someone is flying that drone and there's a whole list of people in that chain of command making decisions. People are pressing buttons. A computer's not doing that. You may have a remote-controlled drone it is flown by a pilot based either in america or in the uk well, nobody is suggesting that that train drivers get replaced by a robot and then it all gets left alone there'll be people in command centers with banks of screens checking and, and as, so the, as, saying, as soon as anything uh, untoward happens then uh, uh, so the alarms will go off and, uh, and people will be running to the scene in order to uh, affect assistance you're telling me that you wish to spend this enormous investment yes, required to take the course in, and you're still going to need a train driver they'll just be remotely no. located in an office somewhere. no you won't need a train driver it will be uh, done well, by com but done by computer well of you've just used the analogy of the drones and now you've referred back to an analogy where you don't have no the there will be a command of course there'll be a command center i mean uh, water and gas and electricity have a command center but their uh, their actual operations are run by computers same Absolutely. with same they're with nu same with nuclear power water and electricity are transporting people Planes fly themselves, Steve. They are yes, significantly. They have a pilot on them. Yeah, but it doesn't do anything. No, there is uh, a, 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 a <laughs> number of times when the pilot will land the aircraft and when the computer will land the aircraft. But if something goes wrong, the pilot's there, the co-pilot's there, the engineer may. But you know there. what goes wrong usually in an airline crash and a train crash and a car crash? Human, Human error. error. Let's remove the human from the equation. Much sure safer. Sure, the crash at all the airport. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You can give me an, any amount of instances that you like, and I can give you a thousand others that were caused by human error. Well, yeah, I, I still challenge, and I think. Well, of course you do, because it's. Uh, I, I mean, of course you stick up for your for yourself and your your well paid position. And that, that's it. Would be um, un, uh, unlikely that you wouldn't do that. But, but what know, I well, what what I what I get from the um, from the the train drivers' disputes is an attempt not to uh, shore up the health and safety. That seems a, a spurious argument to me. It's more that they're trying to prevent the um, the, the their removal entirely from their uh, comfortable positions. There is no dispute in my twenty years within this industry which involves train drivers trying to stop themselves being replaced because there isn't mm, no well not on the surface not on the surface there isn't but i mean all that fuss about the guards on the trains i mean if uh, and the, we had we had the exact same argument when they removed the guards from the trains on the underground uh, yeah. with absolutely no negative for consequences for health and safety whatsoever I had an incident coming out of Liverpool Street where I had a full. Are you, are you giving me an in, a, another specific a, instance? A specific instance. It doesn't make any someone, difference. It makes absolutely well, no well, difference. Of course, it doesn't if you don't listen to the detail. Well, it doesn't. Yeah, the the detail of a specific instance is irrelevant, Steve. We're talking about generality here, and, okay. and computers are far more reliable than human beings. But hey, we've come to the end of our um, our, our uh, time detail, together, uh, and uh, I have enjoyed it. Have we fallen out? Uh, well, if you've got the full, full <laughs> details that I was about to share with you... Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I, I did give you an enormous uh, chunk of this show in order to put your point, and I take your point. And if I was in your position, I'd be defending uh, my, uh, uh, my future as well. Of course I would. Everybody would. But we're talking about the greater good here. Would you mind telling me what this is all about? Yes, it's about the uh, inevitable uh, takeover of artificial intelligence can't happen soon enough john says we don't want driverless cars oh god not another one a luddite he says in fact people will protest against driverless cars by lying down in the road and of course they can't move because of their inbuilt safety features that's all they'll need to do to bring these cars to a standstill and he's completely correct in every respect that's the problem with uh, with the robot cars like i said before people because robot cars will not have the roads to themselves they'll be surrounded by um, morons every time you leave your house you're surrounded by morons have you noticed 
and um, people will not allow uh, robot cars to uh, merge and they won't let them uh, change lanes and they won't let them turn left or right or do anything they'll just bully them because robot cars will be a, will um, have it built in that they don't uh, crash and they don't lean on their horn and they don't um, give people the finger and scream and shout and tailgate and all of the rest of those things that uh, stupid humans do the best thing for all of us would be if um, uh, if all humans were um, uh, if they just removed the steering wheel from all cars overnight and humans um, woke up the next day and nobody was allowed to drive every car on the road was uh, uh, driven by a robot and then um, everybody would get where they're going much more quickly and much more e efficiently and much safer hands up who's with me uh, this one says getting people replaced by artificial intelligence is certainly not a good idea we are so mechanized without AI at the moment it's ridiculous more robots doing jobs will only pressure us humans and the environment to be robot like too well, you know what, I, unless I'm uh, completely misunderstanding the situation, it appears to me that uh, human beings have completely screwed everything up. We had our chance and we blew it. So maybe uh, give um, AI a chance. Correct. Yeah. How bad could it get? I'm sure the Earth would be uh, appreciative. And all we need is, um, uh, in, in order to uh, brave this uh, new world, is um, an increase in our education and how's that going by the way oh, fabulous yeah we're way down the rankings I had um, the uh, list of the PISA rankings those are the ones that um, compare one country against another at about the age of 15 in all sorts of uh, diff uh, different and important subjects like science and reading for instance and the fifth largest economy that's us but don't seem to make no difference we're so far down the uh, the uh, the list of achievements, it's embarrassing. Something like 25th in science or reading or maths or, uh, you know, anything you care to look at. What's the point of being so uh, relatively wealthy as far as our income is concerned? I mean, I know we haven't actually got any money. We're up to our eyeballs in debt. But then so is everybody, apart from China. What's the point of having all that income if we don't spend it on things that would uh, benefit us in the future? It's all short-termism. It's what we'll do for the human race. Short-termism. I say it over and over again, and um, I might as well be um, talking into a bucket. Why doesn't anyone listen to me? Exactly. Donna says the train drivers have nobody to blame but themselves. The Docklands Light Railway is driverless and perfectly safe. Roll on robot drivers. Yeah, the Docklands Light Railway. The uh, the Toy Town uh, Railway uh, the thing that they got going on over there. There's no drivers. You get on and uh, f at first it's a bit alarming. <coughs> you think there's no driver on this thing. But it uh, it starts and it stops and the doors open and uh, you know a nice lady says uh, get out or get on or whatever it is please alight here for the Docklands uh, Light Railway interchange and all that stuff and doesn't need a human being in fact human beings are the ones that just get in the way if only we could just remove all human beings from the world then everything would run much more efficiently I think you'll find that I'm right about that here's a call in uh, Surrey oh Tony. Hello, Nick. Tony, Tony, Tony. Yes. Hi there, hi there. Yeah, this is a this is a subject that's absolutely dear to my mind. Is it? And uh, yes, yes, it is. And <laughs> and I reckon that uh, what you thought it wasn't. Uh, oh no, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> All right, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. That's it. And making sure can be built into the algorithm. So as you were saying to the train driver, mm. all of those circumstances to, that. Um, but it is thought that a human being is necessary. Are in no way necessary. Because no. that can all be thought about beforehand. And if so something untoward does happen, if uh, there is a mechanical problem with the train, and of course a robot won't have no control over that, say it, uh, it breaks a, a widget or a, a spigot comes uh, unhinged, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, and the train uh, coasts gracefully to a halt, then by remote control or by uh, some sort of remote method, an actual real-life person might talk to the passengers on that train and say something like, uh, well, we're waiting for a red signal. I'll give you more yeah, information yeah, when it becomes right, yeah. available. 
Well, yeah. Southern Rail would like to apologise for this delay. Yeah. You know, all of that stuff could be done remotely. <laughs> don't don't need yeah, a absolutely. driver to do it. No, no, no. What for mobile phone do? You know, it puts your voice somewhere else. Yeah. Anywhere in the world. Mm. You know? And uh, and possibly off it if you wanted to. Um, yeah, so to my mind. And so, what's, what's so good? Even if you're off it, I, is that what you just said? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we we, uh, we communicate with uh, Voyager spacecraft, which left in oh, 76, I think it was, oh. and is now uh, approaching interstellar space. You know, it's got way beyond oh. the solar system. <laughs> yeah, it must be pretty... Um, uh, now, imagine looking back from there and seeing the sun, a tiny little dot of an, another insignificant star, yeah. just like the hundreds and thousands of others. And, uh, and I mean, it, it, like from. looking back at us from a distance, as Bette Midler would have uh, <laughs> sung, it must be it must be marvelous because from a distance, the world looks beautiful and peaceful and uh, calm. It's just the uh, nearer you get to us. <laughs> Then yeah. uh, the the inner fighting becomes uh, apparent. Everybody's uh, yeah, tearing lumps right. out of each other over some arbitrary line in the sand, literally. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely no reason for it at all. And I wonder, I wonder if as our space telescopes get better and better, and we're possibly able to actually see an image these um, uh, planets going around other stars, of, of which there's something like uh, fifteen hundred that we've discovered. You know, so that's 1,500 potential... Um, oh, you mean planets that are in the uh, Cinderella zone, not, not Cinderella. It. Uh, uh, no, it's the, the, um, the Goldilocks. Goldilocks zone, <laughs> yeah. That's it, yeah. <laughs> Cinderella is something different entirely, and there's no relation yeah, to what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, the Goldilocks yeah. zone. They're not too warm, yeah. not too cool, uh, just that's right. It. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, um, you know, and that's, that's just uh, 1,500 that we've discovered. There's no reason to suspect that in the huge... Oh, there'll be trillions, trillions and trillions and trillions and an and, yeah, and, right. and unlimited amount yeah so the likelihood of um uh life emerging yeah. mm. is pretty high i reckon uh, well, and, uh, and that's that starts to become mind-boggling because the likelihood of life emerging and being as backward as we are it seems remote. <laughs> it seems more well, likely with the uh, amount of time that has passed since the uh, invention of the universe. Thank you, God. Mm -hmm. We uh, appreciate all your efforts yeah, in that did, regard. Did all right there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's okay. Maybe, maybe uh, it'll be better next time. But um, yeah. since the invention of the uh, universe, the amount of time that's gone by, it's just been uh, huge. Hours and hours. You know, endless, oh, endless right, minutes yeah, yeah. have gone by. And so yeah. it seems unlikely that any other um, intelligent uh, life form would be as backward as we are which means that yeah. we had better keep uh quiet because if they find out that we're here then they're likely to think hmm <laughs> you know like the poster for uh, mars attacks nice planet we'll take it <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm i'm reminded of the, the last line of eric idol's galaxy song in the uh monty python and uh or whatever it was the meaning of life i think and uh, you know and pray that there's intelligent life up there in space because <laughs> there's very little down here on, on earth. earth correct yeah 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 <laughs> yeah no he's, he's, a, he's a good lad so to my mind we should embrace it it's not going to be a problem it's going to release us from the tedium of pointless labor oh uh, you're talking about artificial intelligence yeah, yeah, the yeah. only problem with that is, what are we going to do? Now, the Any only thing that people wish. will be left to do, all that banging and crashing, dirty fingernail stuff, that's going to be done by robots. I mean, it already yeah. is to a large extent, mm -hmm. except in third world countries. And, uh, you know, robots will get to uh, you uh, I eventually, Africa. Uh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's just, as soon as China can build them, they'll send them yeah. over. Don't you worry about that. Yeah. But um, it's it's the the people who have... Uh, no idea that the the future is about to turf them out of their jobs. That's going to be the big problem. And and, and these will be highly educated people, people like lawyers and accountants and you know all the, uh, everybody that um, engages with a computer all day long. Your computer okay. will take your job. Your computer will yeah. have an IQ vastly superior to yours uh, mm. within the time that uh, the new uh, iPhone is um, a, a, is a shiny new uh, object of desire and before the next one comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, uh, I can think that um, we, we've had this um, uh, something called Moore's Law, which is that um, every couple of years, the amount of um, transistors you can get on a, on a chip 
has doubled for since about the 19, well, since uh, chips were uh, started to be manufactured, uh, 1978 or whatever. And, um, but now um, we're wondering what will happen because it's coming we're coming to the limit of what we can get with with uh, sort of a normal electronics well i know nothing uh, about this subject but isn't the the, the next thing so some sort of integration of um uh, quantum uh, computing uh, well some sort of biological uh, um uh, stuff <laughs> Well, no, I, I don't really know what I'm talking about here, but I'm sure that there's some sort of biological stuff that can meld with computers to make um, a, uh, an exponential advancement in um, uh, uh, you know, computing uh, science. All they have to do is to find a way to uh, squirt the biological stuff up a computer. Yeah, well, that's sort of right. The, 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 the way our brain is, is designed is, uh, is the sort of way designed. that a computer could work. <laughs> well, not designed, or it just is, then, is. Yeah. Um, uh, that's the sort of way a computer could work so much better. You know, it's, uh, it's all to do with uh, something called parallel processing. Oh, rather sure, than yeah. sequential. It's, it's, yes, exactly. It's, uh, it's all about the connections, baby. If my brain it, had been designed, it. I'd want my money back. <laughs> Would you? <laughs> it's a brilliant piece of, well, just happened by chance. Yeah. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. The most complicated thing that we know of in the universe. Nick. What, my and, brain? And you've got I, it in I your head. I wouldn't think so. Maybe yours, <laughs> Tony. Not, definitely not <laughs> no, mine. No, not mine. Definitely not mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks for um, giving us a okay. peek into a brave new world. Cheers, Tony. <laughs> Excellent work. Here in uh, beautiful, uh, sunny Portsmouth is a lady called Jan. Jan. Hi, Nick. Hey, Jan, do you have to have your, um, are you, I, I suppose you're not part of the country where you have to have your windows and your doors uh, sealed closed because of the smell of burning plastic, do you? Oh, do you know, for a minute I thought you were going to say you could smell my wood burner. <laughs> no. I don't no, think you're allowed to have wood burners anymore, are you, for the uh, yeah. pollution? I don't think so. No, you are. I wouldn't Honestly, think so. you are. I researched it because... You did? Yeah, and you can leave it where it... It's only conservation areas, and um, you can't in certain places, but I'm in a... We well, used to smoke with coal anyway, but, yeah, we have it all the time, even in the middle of summer. Yeah, so how cold does it get there? Even in the middle of summer you got your uh, wood burner going? Yeah, honestly, it's my other half. He loves fires. Right. He's not an arsonist, though, I promise you. <laughs> well, they do look <laughs> nice, and they are... Exactly, uh, they, that's yeah, what exactly like right, it, yeah. yeah. They're pleasant to behold. Groovy. But they they're making it rather difficult for the rest of us to breathe. <laughs> but don't you worry about that, I Jan. I love your talk over. You're, you're <laughs> fabulous, one, and just absolutely creeping me up. <laughs> now, uh, you know, I always can know you what you really want to say. Well, thanks, Jan. Uh, but, um... Can you actually smell that stuff? Because, you know, um, the uh, it's in Bournemouth, isn't it? But you're part of the same coast. You're not that far away from Bournemouth, are you? So I'd have thought that no, a smell... That you, yeah, a smell that you can get in Bournemouth, uh, you could get in, uh, in Portsmouth. No, that's just Bournemouth. Right. Um, it just... <laughs> I think it's something to do with the generic population. Um, <laughs> what? <no. laughs> because there was this, this, there was this noxious cloud of um poisonous yes, fumes know. that went to, that uh, covered the place uh, a couple of months ago and i went there the very next day and i was a bit concerned about that because i went to the exact area the um uh, the burling gap where um that uh, cloud had made people's eyes go red and uh, uh, made their lungs yeah, ex no, we're explode not, we're not out of their mouths so you haven't been affected although by that saying, okay. although saying that people would argue that portsmouth smells like that anyway but, <laughs> but um no we're not affected by that right. at all here okay but then. the wood burn is going strong and yes you can smell it it's lovely mm, smell. It's real mm, it is smell. yeah I, I love the smell of wood in the morning it smells like uh, autumn yeah yeah definitely yeah so anyway I, was, I just wanted to say to you as well was that previous caller tony i swore to god it was t uh, david bellamy you're on the phone too <laughs> he was David brilliant. Wummaging about. No, not David he was Bellamy. Absolutely brilliant, though, wasn't he? Uh, well, let's not get carried away, Joan. No, his enthusiasm. <laughs> he was totally eccentric, but his enthusiasm was absolutely delightful. Right. Is David Bellamy still with us? I'm not sure, actually. No. He's not been in my head lately, so I can't really yeah, say. I don't know either. Anyway. Um, you, you were talking about artificial intelligence, but mm. I'm probably going off, off piece here with um, computers and that, and how they can affect actually us as human beings emotional beings go on well i was at thought park recently with my sister and 
I'm a scaredy cat and I was really brave and went on every single ride, which I was really chuffed with, but Vortex was closed because the computer had said it's too windy. And honest to God, there was no gust or anything. <laughs> and I was so disappointed because I was just so desperate to go on every ride. Now, let me ask you a question about this, Jan, because I got um, um, a damage, uh, I got mental damage by going on a, a roller coaster ride. Did you? I did. I still feel <laughs> I not. Believe it. I'm not quite right t to this day. And this was um, a tour, decade. Was this it? was a decade or more ago. This was in Spain, oh, and I went oh. to um, a, 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 an amusement park near a Barcelona. And this was before they Barcelona. started. They were, uh, were you know fighting with each other, the Spanish. And there <laughs> yeah, was there was almost nobody there. And so it, it was. I was in the unusual position of uh, having all of these uh, spectacular rides with no queues. Now I bet oh, that no, didn't happen at Thorpe Park. Fabulous. And so, because there were no queues, I decided to go on the most violent ride um, uh, uh, more than once. And the first time I came off, I felt a little unsteady on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about mental damage here, Jan. This is, this is not funny. <laughs> no, the first the time I came friends. off, I felt a little uh, woozy, you know. Woozy. And the second time I, I came off, I felt, well, I've, I've actually um, got a bit of a headache uh, now, but as there is no queue, I'll go on again. I'm go on again, yeah. What an so idiot. <laughs> and the third time I came off that thing, I felt, well, I, I actually feel as though, um, a, like, a boxer must feel after going uh, a, a couple of rounds with somebody who's much, much better than them. I feel, as though, drink, yeah. Yeah, I feel as though I've been hit in the head a lot. God. So I think that what happened was that my, my brain was slooshing about in uh, my, my brain water. <laughs> stuff that's well, in your skull. I know what you mean. Cause there's it, one, yeah, it was, there's I was bashing ride, about, and I actually there's bruised there's my one. brain hole, Jan. Yeah, no, that's serious. Serious thing. I mean, we came off, and I was really chuffed, because halfway through, I had to, my sister had, my bless her heart, had to get me, um, get me a wheelchair, because I've not been too well. And, um, but of course, with a wheelchair, we got straight to the front of the queue. <laughs> <laughs> So we were on the front of all the rides. Well, now, how did people take it when you zoomed to the front of the queue and then leapt out of the wheelchair in order to get on a <laughs> roller coaster? <laughs> yeah, there is that point. Well, bless them. I didn't shave my head on purpose, but I'm just bored through the chemo. But seriously, no, everyone was delighted. They were absolutely wonderful to us. But, yeah, we did. That. We have to go and see the exit ramp in a wheelchair. Mm. And so we were at the front for every ride. And people were like, no, go on. And we were going on the front on such a scaredy cat. But, it was, but we went on the ride sore. And like we, both of us said we couldn't do that again because it just literally, as you just described, your head was yeah. like, well, it felt um, like a nut in a bloody well, jar. Well, yeah, I, I've been um, cautious about going on anything that, uh, that moves faster than uh, my car since. <laughs> any any violent changes of uh, direction, uh, I, uh, you know, makes me feel a little bit strange. But you, no, you no, but no, but your not. experience is that artificial intelligence is not a good idea. Well, in short, I just I just think there's too many humans on the planet for it. To, I just <laughs> there's a film with Sylvester Stallone and years ago. I watched Sandra Bullock, and it was like those that have and those that have not, and it was like the subhuman class. And I can just see it going that way. And that would be there is already a subhuman class. I mean, th this idea that we're all together and uh, everybody has equal Don't opportunity. Know. And you've uh, obviously been down to Portsmouth quite a bit, then. Well, I've been I've been to Portsmouth <laughs> and I quite liked it. There's nothing wrong I with Portsmouth. Did as well, yeah. I've been there since '86 when I left the navy, so I can't complain. Oh, no, but, did, you, um, did you take a lot of drugs in the navy, Jan? <laughs> <laughs> because apparently it's rife. <laughs> well, I'm just asking. Want to score some pot? Yeah, there was a couple of uh, a couple of people who were fired from uh, our uh, nuclear submarine because they were, had yes. uh, cocaine. Now you, you'd think that that would keep them alert. Apparently, they enjoyed the crack. <laughs> 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 These are the jokes, folks. But uh, you, you were on you were on the navy, and surely um, I mean it must be so excruciatingly boring to be stuck in a tin um, uh, v vessel. Yeah, I did all my sea time on the Gosport ferry. I was before friends went to sea, thank goodness. I did the sea tom on the Gosford Ferry and the Tall Point Ferry, yeah. That's not being in the Navy. I know, yeah, but I did a lot of sea tom of my late father, who's a master mariner, so that counts for a lot. I went deep sea to Aussie with him, so that counts. And I was the best branch in the Navy, the White Mafia, commonly known as the chefs. Right. So okay. it's up to the chef, to the right. white mafia. So it didn't really matter <laughs> one way or the other where you were. It, it, no, you were, really. you were in you were in the kitchen. You could have been in a hotel. 
If it's brown, turn it okay. round. If it's black, give it to Jack. <laughs> Right. Uh, I'm going to ask you not to explain that to me, but my, my mind is reeling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Jan. Yeah, I bet that if they chucked out every single a person in the Navy who had ever uh, a, a, a availed themselves of some uh, illegal drug, there wouldn't be hardly anybody left. They should be careful what they start. I know that they have um, a, a no-tolerance policy of, of being um, uh, out of your mind actually on duty, but what difference does it make if you're off duty? Just, uh, just a thought. I mean, they're, they're in want of staff. I know they are. Woefully understaffed they are in the uh, armed services. I, I thought they were... Um, uh, I thought that we needed every single uh, man and woman that we had working in our uh, armed services rather than uh, getting rid of them uh, left and right for something that they did uh, uh, while um, not actually on board but you know maybe that's just me martin says i've been to the same theme park in spain near barcelona we went on a school trip but i couldn't go on any of the rides because i spent all my money on food in the park <laughs> who goes to a, a a park full of roller coasters and spends all their money on food of course, if you're stuffed full of food, then going on a roller coaster is the last thing you want to do. And, and not just for you either, but for everybody that's in front of, uh, behind, above and below. And uh, Lee says, Nick, if cyber, cyber criminals can hack CIA computers, don't tell me they can't hack railway infrastructure and cause serious damage. You make some very valid points about the march of technology, but that will also come with serious risks. Yeah, but no more serious risks than we have at the moment with um with, with the doughy dopey human beings in charge i'll lo i'll look it up if you want me to but the uh, the number of people that die on the roads due to human error is absolutely staggering it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds a week if not thousands it's amazing the death toll on the roads and it's all because of stupid morons driving Almost none of it is due to um, a, a, a mechanical error. Same with planes. Practically every plane crash that there ever was is because of uh, stupid humans. And the sooner... I mean, we've had our chance and we blew it. Obviously, we are not capable of, of being in charge of uh, anything that's uh, more complicated than a pet. <laughs> so uh, let's stop kidding ourselves. And let the robots take control. Correct. I uh, still haven't got to that uh, Trump letter that uh, he um, is uh, alleged to have written about himself, detailing his uh, attractiveness to women. <laughs> it's priceless. Um, so I'll, I'll try and remember to come to that uh, in a while. Let's get back to it. Brian uh, emails or tweets or uh, texts, there are little white pods that take you to Terminal 5 at Heathrow. No driver, that works fine. Pods. Ah, you uh, install yourself in a, in a pod. And it takes you all the way to a Terminal 5. Groovy. Doesn't that sound like the future? A little bit. Uh, no crashes yet, not that I've heard of. And, and see, that's the thing, is we'll, we'll know immediately if any a robot-controlled vehicle crashes, because it will be instant news. But if it's uh, a human-controlled vehicle that crashes, nobody's remotely interested at all. It will never make the news, because uh, there's just too many of them. That's the thing, is this, this background hum of uh, mayhem and we don't know anything we're, we're completely ignorant of it because it's not news because this just happens too much i should have looked it up how many uh, i bet my glamorous assistant through there uh would uh, look up how many people die on britain's roads on a yearly basis uh, i bet the number will be absolutely staggering joe says there's no way i would set foot on a train without a fully trained driver in charge their pay reflects the responsibility they have for uh, the train and its passengers oh please no it doesn't their pay reflects the um, the effect that they have when they withdraw their labor on london that's what their pay reflects responsibility and a fully trained driver in charge well i maintain that driving a car is more difficult than driving a train a car will go wherever you point it a train will just stick to wherever the lines go easy and um, the amount of cabs that I've got in, not black cabs, because, you know, that's a luxury product. And, oh, I can only dream of being able to afford a luxury. 
But um, on the uh, seldom occasions that I've uh, gone into a uh, you know a, a cab that's not a a, 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 a recognised London a black cab. Oh, th those uh, are supposedly fully trained drivers. Warning! Warning! I'm surprised that most of them can figure out how to put their socks on. They shouldn't be in charge of running a bath, let alone a car. Fully trained driver. Buses as well. Much more difficult than driving a train. I wouldn't um, uh, give uh, the average uh, bus driver the responsibility of looking after my dog. <laughs> Uh, of course, I'd have to get a dog first, but that's uh, not the point. Joanne says, hey, if train operatives can be replaced by robots, why not replace passengers as well? Then everyone would be happy. <laughs> now you're thinking, Joanne. It's called in Brighton. Hello, Jake. Hello, Nick. Hiya. Jake, um, can, you, can, you can you can you smell... Get... Jake, can you smell that smell? Um, I, haven't, I haven't started talking yet, Nick. Um... Well, I'm not asking you about talking. I'm talking about no, smelling. No, no, I, thought, no I, was, I, was, I was. I guess I was, I was sort of being slightly. Not, well, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to speak any hogwash. Is what I'm going to say. Um, I think I, I, don't, I don't know what you've been talking about in terms of smells, Nick. So I don't know the context. The well, context. The context is that on the south coast of Britain, apparently, there's this noxious plastic burning smell, and I just wondered if really? uh, you yeah. can smell it where you are. Oh, no, I can't. I've got all the windows shut. Oh ah, well, that's it then. My yeah. son's sleep. My son's sleeping, so he, he's you know, two years old. So you know, I to, he's got a bit of a bad cough. So I've only opened one window. <laughs> okay. Yes, but anyway, okay. So basically, yeah, the the issue tonight is about uh, driverless vehicles and AI intelligence and this, that, and the rest of it. Um, I thought sort I of wanted to. I mean, and, I, and I've heard that you're for it, which is great. But, um, and you want to get rid of humans, which is... Yeah, uh, straight away, uh, if not sooner, for, for the benefit <laughs> of the planet. I know, I'd agree with you, certainly. You know, um, I definitely would, I would agree with you, but uh, I, what do you think about electric cars and the prospect of them? Oh, I, I would love to replace my car with an electric car, but uh, as they're in a sort of a first iteration at the moment, it's probably best to, mm. uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for two reasons I can't do that. First... The next generation of electric cars will probably be better, and second, I can't afford them. Yeah, same. Yeah, I mean, the thing, and also, you know, I, I must admit, I've become somewhat, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there, especially on the internet and elsewhere. And I've been sort of beginning to, in regards to, you know, the, how viable it's going to be. I mean, you know, with, with the government legislation coming in, and um, uh, but you have to look at government where, legislation. What le what legislation? Well, 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 they say they, well, I don't know if it's, if it's been put in, but they say they're going to they're going to make all cars, um, all diesel cars and all petrol cars banned by 2030, 2040. 2040, yeah. By which time uh, the planet will probably be a burnt cinder. I mean, they're not really rushing to uh, save us from uh, a, an invidious future, are they? 2040. No, yeah, but also, you know, I mean, but, if, but you get things like but then the major oil companies like OPEC and Exxon, they, they say. That only something like well, X, OPEC says six percent of its cars will be electric, and um, Exxon says OPEC. Of its, yeah, uh, o, uh, yeah, OPEC. Opal. Uh, says it, OPEC. Uh, might be Opal. It, it, no, is, no, no, sorry, no. It, I think it's OPEC. What the 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 oil petroleum um, uh, organization? The uh, yes. the yeah, yeah. Oh, the, yeah. Well, they, they don't not, they not, don't not, make cars. That's factory. that's Saudi Arabia and uh, all of that lot. No, but they, 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 these oil companies are, are sort of saying that, 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 that these are their projections for how many cars will be electric or hybrid in the future. Just, just yeah. they have to pay All of them will be. All of them will be. We'll, we'll look back in 50 years and, and, and not be able to believe the, uh, the fug of pollution that people used to have to walk about in, in the cities. It, London is virtually he... unbreathable. The air in the centre of London sure. now. No, no, I, and I don't live in London. I, I can't, and I haven't been there for quite a, for a little while. Um, but I mean, but I mean, why? How come all these big, all these big, all these big, uh, you know, internal combustion manufacturers yeah. are putting their money in, towards internal combustion engines going forward? And very few of them. It seems they're only paying lip service to uh, environmental stuff. Well, that's because well, that's because uh, the, uh, the internal combustion engine is has reached a uh, 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 almost yeah. perfection now. It's as good as it's going to get, really. And their entire uh, manufacturing uh, setup is uh, designed around 
uh, building Keep engines that run on petrol and uh, diesel. So they don't want to change. They will have to be forced to change, which means that, which means government action. And some governments, um, you know, the uh, EU and uh, you know other more enlightened. Uh, uh, governmental organizations they are actually doing something about it but as usual our own government is uh, sitting on its hands doing nothing thinking about only the short term and saying by 2040 we might do something which is akin to saying um we, we we're not really going to do anything at all mm, yeah. because it but might be un of... because it might be unpopular in the short term and that's actually uh, what's the situation here but, it's but i mean I we'll get to ai stuff but, I will, but also i mean just just in terms of the the, the structural and the logistical side of things. I mean, trying to get, you know, I mean, not everyone's going to be able to charge their, their their, their car outside their home. Uh, you know what, there's there's no end of problems to uh, to a, an advancement of any kind, but they should just do it. I mean, every lamppost in the land has got electricity running through it. What's so hard about to, just to changing them? Well, I did see something quite funny about, you know, if, if people start plugging... So one of the comments, someone on Guardian, or on one of the websites said, you know, what if you start plugging, you know, people start putting, you know, plugging their car in overnight, and then the little so-and-so's unplugging them whilst you sleep. <laughs> Which is, again, a, a, a trivial thing to, 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 to ponder on. But, yeah, um, yeah there, I just see that it just it just highlights to me that there could be a never-ending sort of flow of... of, 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 of hurdles to get past obviously they're going to matter because we, we you know if if, if, if if human beings want to survive as a species um but well imagine if cars didn't exist and somebody invented the internal combustion engine in its current form and said wow no, now we don't have to walk everywhere look at this uh, fabulous invention that we've got isn't it great i mean we've got all of these roads so why don't we actually uh, put cars on them instead of skateboards and people said oh well it'd be very difficult so uh, we'll just forget it and we'll continue to uh, ride a, a, a plank of wood with wheels on it true true no one's good yeah uh, however that that would be healthier for the environment i guess when we you know <laughs> we're in a situation now whereby well let's let's know, not get carried away we don't want to encourage any more people to uh, to take up skateboarding <laughs> the worst sounding sport ever yeah, invented I'm, I'm with you on that. the I'm only thing that's that worse sound sounding than skateboarding is leaf blowers God, I hate those things. <laughs> but, I mean, on our artificial intelligence, I mean, I think it was Stephen Hawking that said, um, you know, in, in the future, you know, it'll end like Terminator or something, something to, those, to, yeah. to that effect. Um, and we'll be run by machines and, and this certain the rest of it. Mm. But, I mean, you see, you see the gradual implementation of self-service machines everywhere, and um, you, you've seen these things over the last 20 years, really. I mean, I left school in... in, in, in oh, we ain't, yeah, we ain't seen nothing yet. It's about no. to really get into overdrive. We, we yeah. are going to be overwhelmed with the speed at which this stuff happens. But I'm also... I'm also... I'm also... Slightly, you know sad that I'm not going to be there to see all of it. <laughs> well, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, yeah, but I just, I feel like, you know, I mean, 50 years time, you know, I mean, you know, let's... I don't think you'll have to wait that long, time. Jake. I, I don't know, how <laughs> how old are you? <laughs> uh, 30, well, I have to think then, 33. 33? So well, if you uh, just take care of yourself and you stick around for at least in the next 20 years, you're going to see a change like no uh, no generation has ever seen change. It's it's all going to happen oh. right now. This is the amazing thing about being alive right now. We are the luckiest people that have, uh, that have ever lived. For several yeah. reasons. First of all, we're at the, we can still remember uh, when things were analog, and there's something uh, tr tremendously comforting about analog. It's more the speed of our uh, thought processes now. You know, reading an actual paper book, listening to uh, music in album form, uh, watching television shows once a week when they come around uh, as per schedule on the TV channels, and all of that. You know, sort of being fed. Um, a, a, a diet on television, which is, is, yeah, yeah. is actually quite satisfying, we, we, yeah. we, as opposed to just this infinite variety of things that you could watch at any one time, which becomes a bit yeah. overwhelming, the choice. Yeah, so we've yeah, got yeah. that, but we also have this other digital thing, which is um, an, an infinite variety, if we want to, yeah. uh, and we've got uh, mobile phones, we've got computers in our pockets, the likes of which previous generations couldn't even have imagined. And th those are all about to become bendy, and you'll be able to fold them out and stick them in your pocket, it'll be the size of a credit card but it'll fold out to the size of a laptop you know all of this stuff is uh, uh, about to um uh, to work right. uh, to come in uh, but we also uh, are living on the, the planet just before it gets a little bit too full because as uh, people are uh, you know having uh, hot interpersonal uh, relations uh, with each other disgusting 
then our numbers will increase uh, exponentially and we're, it's going to get quite uh, quite packed our little yeah. planet and there's also going to be uh, problems with the water and food and all, all the rest of it which uh, uh, isn't the case now but it will be in a hundred well, years time people are going to have a big problem so th this th the particular moment I would suggest is the greatest moment to be alive in human history both uh, it, uh, in the past and probably in the future and well, we're in Britain it doesn't get any better than that Jake no yeah uh, you might be right it might be it might be even even more sort of uh, influential than the, the industrial revolution oh, uh, you know definitely. Revolution, but, 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 I, but um y you know I mean I <laughs> I watched something long, long ago about uh, space travel and how you know they, 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 were, they were talking about how, the, how they would be, be able to travel thousands of light years mm. and, and travel to you know, planets, planets Centauri and all these different things and pop yeah. in the bee and all these different. But but uh, I don't know if, if any of that's really going to. to I think we'll probably be gone by then. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm a bit of a pessimist when it comes to when it comes to. Uh, you know, well, yeah, I suppose so. But uh, let's let's leave uh, inter interstellar space travel for <laughs> future generations yeah, when yeah, when yeah, they yeah. actually need to leave the Earth because it's a burning cinder. Let's just enjoy uh, what we've got right now. There's plenty to explore right That's here on Earth, uh, Jake. That's a good point, and I think I think it's important to, to, to remember that the actual the, the Earth will always be here. I, I do believe this well. rock <laughs> will always actually be here. I mean, the life on it probably not, Maybe. but the rock itself. Could oh, still yeah. survive. Yeah, it, it will. Uh, when, when we're long gone, it will still be here in uh, some form or other. Yeah, and that's nice to know. I think. That's well, quite nice I to suppose know. so. Yeah, just as long as it <laughs> sticks around while uh, while we're still alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Jake. Good talking to you. It can only be attributable to human error. Pretty much everything can be attributable to human error. Everything that is bad, everything that is bad and sad. And the only way that we can um, uh, face the future and actually profit from it in some way, shape or form is by education. Pink Floyd were wrong. Hey, you teacher, don't leave them kids alone. Rock and roll! And Jeremy Corbyn seems to be the uh, person who is uh, saying um, uh, smart things about uh, education. We need uh, more educating in this country because uh, whatever we're doing now ain't working that well. I mean, just listen to me. It ain't working not nor nothing and making it more expensive it doesn't seem to be um, how can that possibly be the answer making it more expensive than almost all of our uh, major competitors apart from America and nobody should follow America uh, about uh, doing anything you are going to love President Trump <laughs> particularly that I think the only country in the world that has a more expensive education system than we do is America why are we following the worst examples just curious. Jeremy Corbyn on this radio station said that tuition fees would have already been abolished if the Labour Party had won June's general election. Would you, uh, would, would you like to take the referendum again? No. Oh, okay. He said Labour would end tuition fees for colleges and universities and adult education. Well, that seems pretty clear. He said, we would therefore grant free education for everyone to go through to a degree level. And uh, some um, people from opposing parties said, what? as with one voice, as though it's the stupidest thing that anybody ever heard. Free education? Why would anybody want that? They thought. And who's going to pay for it? How are we going to be able to afford free education? Where are we going to get the money to buy all those weapons of mass destruction we promised ourselves? I mean, nuclear weapons don't buy themselves, you know. What a, what a twisted up world we live in. That we have an unlimited amount of money to buy weapons of uh, uh, mass destruction that we will never use, not now, not ever, never. We have an open checkbook for that. But as far as education goes, well, uh, I'm sorry. But we just don't have the money. Would you like to afford it yourself? We would grant free education for everyone to go through to degree level, says Jeremy Corbyn. He says we would do that as soon as, uh, uh, as, soon as uh, taking office. And had we been elected into office in June, they would have already been abolished for this academic year. What a concept. I think the Tories are in big trouble. But who are they actually appealing to these days? You'd have to be... Um, like, I think their uh, their audience is uh, dying off. 
the audience is reaching the end of their uh, particular conveyor belt. The young people are looking at Labour and thinking, well, look, well they're particularly looking at Jeremy Corbyn and thinking, well, you know what, it'll be in my best interest to vote Labour. I mean, people just vote uh, uh, based on what their best interests are. And young people are no different to old people in that regard. And it had always been the case that when you reach, oh, I don't know, about 40 years old, something like that, then you uh, would uh, switch, assuming that you started as uh, a left-leaning person, you would switch to becoming a right-leaning person in order to protect the wealth that you had acquired. But that's not the case anymore. That equation is broken. People aren't acquiring wealth. There's an entire generations now who won't be able to afford a house and they won't have any pension. We've got the, one of the worst pension uh, systems in the world, apparently. And the uh, government is um, making moves to uh, to change it, but uh, not as significant a change as they are enjoying pretty much everywhere else on earth. We're looking at generations living in abject poverty when they get old. So. This idea that uh, at about 40 years old people start to uh, come to their senses and vote conservative, that, that's not going to happen anymore. Because as previous generations have done, they've got houses and they've had the children and they've got a little bit of uh, money saved up and they've got a pension coming in and they're doing really well. Why would they vote Labour? They have to be off their chump to vote Labour in those circumstances. They're going to vote conservative because, uh, you know, I'm all right, Jack, and I want to keep what I've got. But like I said, that equation is broken now. But people aren't, they haven't got the money to acquire houses. They're going to be a generation rent for their entire lives. And so the Conservatives' natural um, audience, their natural well of uh, support, is going to be dry. Because there isn't going to be the uh, number of people who have acquired some uh, degree of uh, wealth that they want to uh, maintain, they want to keep. I think they're looking at uh, decades uh, out of power. And what's extraordinary is that uh, Labour, with a man uh, with a weird beardy like Jeremy Corbyn, a man who the right-wing press have heaped opprobrium on like nobody I can remember ever, the wall of negative publicity that that man has uh, suffered uh, at the hands of the right-wing press has just been staggering. And he's still more popular than our current Prime Minister. It's unbelievable. Imagine what Labour would be in the polls if they actually had somebody popular as their leader. Or maybe, maybe not popular is not the right word, maybe uh, more acceptable to the general population. There, I'll put it like that. Maybe if Jeremy Corbyn uh, shaved once in a while, might be a good idea. Bought himself a suit. Cut down that, um, the, the foliage uh, outside his front door so he didn't have to hack his way uh, in and out of his house. That <laughs> might be a better look. But, I don't know, it seems to make perfect sense to me. Maybe not for uh, all uh, subjects. I mean, if you want to do, um, oh, I don't know, as, if, if you want to study the Aztecs to uh, master's level, well, maybe the, uh, the nation shouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, subsidising you for that. But science, I mean, come on. Physics, of course. Why aren't we uh, providing free or at least heavily subsidised uh, education for people who want to do th uh, subjects that will actually benefit the nation in the long term? Why on earth does it cost as much to study uh, a, a dopey, wishy-washy subject like psychology, for instance, as it does to uh, study uh, chemistry? That makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. If it makes sense to you, then uh, you'll have to explain it to me. I still haven't got around to that um, letter that Donald Trump allegedly wrote to himself detailing why women are so attracted to, to, to Donald Trump. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I'll get to that in the, in the next hour. You'll yeah, have to remind me, though, I'm directing that comment to my glamorous assistant because I just keep forgetting. You know, I'm all wrapped up in, uh, in the future. Correct. Oh, Lax says, Lax, that's L-A-K-S... <laughs> Crying out for more robots to improve everything, I feel, is short-sighted. What? Uh, he or she says, all efficiency and slick and bereft of any humanity. I would much rather to be able to walk to a good library and pub. Let's instead argue for better local communities. 
Well, local communities are what you make yourself, surely. Don't wait for somebody else to make your community better. I think that's something you have to do for yourself, isn't it? And as for the bereft of any humanity, well, uh, until they are smart enough to program themselves, we, uh, meat sacks, will be programming computers. So they will exhibit whatever humanity we stick up them. <laughs> so to speak. Chiswick, oh, Joe, Zo, Z, Z. Hello, how are you? I'm great, mate. What's up? Good. Well, I mean, I'm thinking back. I'm 53 now. 53. And... Yeah. You made it. Yes, I did. Indeed. And in my time, when I was being educated, we had woodwork, we had metalwork, we had needlework, we had cooking lessons. Uh, we had all of these how, different how did you have time for uh, How did you have Sorry? time for actual real subjects? Metalwork, well, needlework, Biology, woodwork? chemistry, physics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we had all of that. We had, and also, we had RE, which was a bit of a Ugh. I know, no, I didn't agree with that either. And... Um, <clears throat> Did but you used to get the, the Did you used to get the belt or the whip or the uh, slipper? In no, we school? were told to stand by the wall. Right. Okay. And which was the uh, uh, the, in, the the teacher of which subject was the strictest and the the one that was seen to be keenest on uh, punishment? You won't believe this, but this is honestly true. His name was. Well, don't tell us his name. Just tell us the subject that he taught. Uh, well, he he taught uh, history. Oh right. Okay. His name was Mr. Crook. <laughs> 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 Honestly. <laughs> because the, t the teacher that was keenest on um, getting the belt out and beating small boys was the teacher who's, who taught religious education. <laughs> and I thought, ha, huh, isn't that educational and informative? How instructive, I thought. Curious. <laughs> well, I don't mean, what can I say? But it was, it was a really good school, though. Okay then, you know, uh, and I got good qualifications, and uh, but that was all because it was so strict. Yeah, and we were caught smoking behind the the bike sheds, mm -hmm. and again we were put by the wall, and uh, <laughs> then I. <didn't, laughs> that I doesn't seem like any again. kind of punishment. Put by the wall. You had, you had to stand by the wall outside yeah. Mr. Crook's office. Now, did you have to stand facing the wall? No, no, actually, no. It wasn't that. Oh, bad. then that's nothing. <laughs> Did you lean against the wall? No, no, leaning wasn't allowed. Right, okay. You know, so it was that bad. You know, well, that you doesn't sound, that doesn't sound like a punishment to me. I'll tell you what a punishment is. A punishment is taking a leather belt that's about three foot long and a quarter of an inch uh, thick and about two inches wide, split up the middle so uh, that it parted in the air and came together on the palm of your hand so as to inflict... The lashings get worse. Uh, and so as to inflict greater, uh, greater pain. Yeah. In Scotland, in the freezing blooming cold, do you know how, how much it how much more it hurts when your hands are cold and they put no, a it, book if they're over cold it. enough they go numb then you don't feel anything no, you've got no idea what you're talking about z you've never had the belt <laughs> in your life <laughs> and the book that they put over your wrists so that the belt wouldn't slash your wrists and have you bleed to death on the headmaster's carpet well, was was a bible well, God. luckily now we have protection against these kind of cruelties. Yeah. And if someone is caught doing that, they'll be taken to task. Yeah, or put in the Palace of Westminster. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can take your pick. That is going to... Uh, I am curious to find out what uh, is going to happen there, because if every single elected representative that had ever made a fumbling drunken pass at their uh, gorgeous youthful assistant is um, uh, d is uh, has their name uh, spread across the newspapers then th th the place is going to be empty th there isn't going to be anybody left in there well i mean you know i mean it looks like it's going to go that way because also we're going to be taken over by robots <clears throat> well i don't think that has anything well you know if a robot wouldn't um, uh, make a, a, a fumbling pass at their uh, assistant. A robot wouldn't insist on a, uh, a, a double room or an adjoining room at uh, their uh, conference. Uh, a, a robot wouldn't sexually abuse human beings. They might sexually abuse other robots, but who cares about that? Well, it depends how they're programmed. Yeah, well, I suppose so. <laughs> you could always, un in, in an emergency, you could always unplug one. Uh, well, no, because these would be self-charging. 
<laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> there'd be some way out of it. Robots aren't uh, aren't the problem. People are the problem, not robots. Yeah, but we the people built the robots in the first place, and that'll be what will move us in the second place, and that'll what will take over the world in the third place. Well, I know that uh, some people with brains the size of planets have suggested that the future is uh, very much like the uh, the text of a Terminator movie. Correct. But I don't uh, really uh, see it that way. I mean, if we have the control of programming these things in the first place, then we should surely be able to program them so that they are benign and kind to us human beings. And yeah, they're, but uh, they are our, they are our assistants rather than our nemeses. Yeah, but the many robots can rebuild themselves. Mm. And then they're given the instruction that you are not to take over. Uh, then there will be a little loophole in that program, and that thing that will enable the robot to think, "Well, I want to take over. What's stopping me from taking over?" <laughs> A lot of people are very negative about the future, then the future is artificial intelligence. And I think it's going to be a good thing, not a bad thing. It will uh, enable us humans to actually become free of the, the, the drudgery of life. But who wants to sit in front of a computer and enter numbers all day long, like accountants have to? I'll tell you who. Nobody. That's who. Gar Gary McKinnon. Who's that? That's the guy that broke into the UFO MUFON files. And uh, and uh, was taken. Oh my God! I mean, he he. They, they wanted to take him. NASA wanted to take him back. Uh, extract him <laughs> back to America. NASA. <laughs> yeah. Well, they want to stick him in a rocket. Uh, well, I don't. I, it's got nothing to do with uh, what we're uh, talking about. Uh, whoever it is that you're uh, referring to, I think that. Um, well, the, 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 your listeners uh, can look him up, Gary McKinnon. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah but that's surely not why you called. No, I've been, I've been rambling on about a lot of stuff. You rambling? Know. On this show? No, it doesn't sound like this programme. Rambling? Yeah, no, no, this is the programme. You've said this that... Is, um, this, this, is, this is Radio London, isn't it? Yeah, OK. He doesn't even know where he's called. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Z. Listeners with material. Ugh. Uh, Andy says, if we allow robots to take charge, it would soon become impossible to take back total control. All of these experts predicting with great certainty what might happen in the future. He says there would be a tipping point where they begin to communicate independently with each other. This is when they would see us as expensive, needy, inefficient and expendable. Now they begin to operate fully in their own self-interests. <laughs> they become self-aware. Affirmative. Yeah. And then Skynet launches uh, uh, the uh, first wave of uh, missiles to Russia, knowing that they will uh, fire back, and uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I've seen that film over and over and over again, and it doesn't end well for the human race. But that's a film. Talking about real life here, baby. Graham says a degree is only useful if graduates can get a job in the subject they passed in. What's the use of somebody getting a degree in media studies if they end up working at Tesco's? A waste of money. Corbyn's proposal of free fees across the board is crackers. No, well, it's not crackers, because we used to have that. And we fashioned a whole country on uh, the basis of free education. Other countries uh, do exactly that. Why is it so nuts that we do? I mean, it's like saying that it's just insane that, uh, that um, uh, health care is free at the point of use. Practically no other country on earth does it that way. But we seem to be uh, wedded to that idea. We almost, uh, it, it's, it's odd, we sort of get used to whatever situation we're in, even if it's a bad one, and then defend that position, uh, regardless of uh, whether it would be uh, better to improve it or not. If, I think that's, uh, that is a, um, it's, it's part of the psyche of being a human being, that you just are very resistant to change. I mean, if somebody was banging you on the head with a hammer and they did it uh, on the hour, every hour, and somebody suggested that they stop, um, there would be a significant number of people who would say, stop, well, no, hang on a minute, what, what do you mean stop? Stop and then do what? Graham says that, oh no, I've read that one already. Yeah, that's what I was talking about, that... Um, Okay, media studies. You know, maybe, maybe there should be uh, studies that are more expensive uh, than others, that are uh, more 
uh, whose uh, the, the knowledge that is acquired is is more ephemeral, more um, uh, less useful to society. But that does not include uh, chem all of the sciences and the engineering studies and um, architecture, perhaps, and uh, you know all that good stuff. The societies benefit from. I mean, if uh, France can uh, provide uh, subsidised education, and uh, uh, Switzerland can do it, and Germany can do it, and Spain and Portugal and Belgium and every other country on the blooming earth, all of our major competitors are much cheaper than we are. Why can't we do it? Why is it so crazy for us to provide the free education? We used to. I am the product of free education. I was one of the last uh, people to uh, get uh, everything for free. In fact, it was better than free. The government used to give me money just to make uh, uh, life more comfortable at university. What? And guess what I spent it on? It wasn't books, I can tell you that right now. Everything was free. Um, the bar was subsidised. The uh, uh, accommodation was subsidised. We used to get our laundry done for us, and the government gave us money. And now the, uh, the poor, penurious students are um, leaving university with a degree that is shortly going to be uh, completely worthless because a robot's going to take their job. And on top of that, they've got a debt pile on top of them that you could uh, see from space. How does that make sense? The only way that we can uh, address the future and conquer it and uh, you know uh, and sort of fashion some place in the world after China takes over is by um, educating our youth otherwise we are uh, we're screwed but the short-term uh, solution to the problem of funding uh, education is to make uh, students uh, pay for it or to take to take gigantic loans out that's the short-term solution and the, uh, as is so often the case the short-term solution is also the worst solution in the long term and that's what we got right now stupid 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 when will we learn and i think the answer to that is uh, not now not ever never i still haven't got that donald trump letter good grief what is wrong with me it's like i'm resisting it robot personal bodyguards is where it all kicks off they will make us nostalgic for plain old guns. <laughs> I think the military is going to be the uh, thing that uh, moves this uh, forward, and the uh, maybe it is maybe it's not uh, ineptitude on the on the part of the government to allow our uh, military personnel to get to uh, such um, catastrophically low numbers. Maybe it's part of their little scheme in order to um, uh, introduce uh, robot soldiers. Maybe the uh, advancing technology is much further along than we thought. Because that's the future. Wars are fought by robots, not uh, people. Of course, when robots start uh, shooting other robots, then um, we'd we better uh, duck and, uh, and uh, get out of the way. We'd better uh, skate off to another planet. Meg says, I hope they never put robots in charge of world conservation, because the first thing they do is wipe us out to save the planet. <laughs> That'd be a good idea to save the flora and the fauna, for we eat it all. <laughs> well, it's its fault for being so delicious. That's my excuse. Uh, Tony says, Nick, do it yourself. Time may be an illusion anyway. Don't touch that clock. Well, I thought about that. Why do we have to suffer this every blooming year? I mean, uh, uh, unless I'm uh, misunderstanding this completely, we have to suffer the next, uh, what is it, six months in almost perpetual darkness just because uh, a, a handful of the Scottish dairy farmers don't want to fumble around in the dark for a teat. Have I got that right? And, uh, and, and that's it. Why do the rest of us have to suffer? Every year this comes around and I believe that the politicians will never do anything about it because if they do, a, a, um, uh, there will be a negative consequence. There'll be an accident on the road, or uh, a, a, a farmer will grab hold of what he thought was a teat. Turned out not to be. <laughs> and, you know, it will, it will hit the news, and the politician responsible for changing the, uh, circ the, uh, the circumstance that we find ourselves in will be blamed. Which is why they never do anything. 
They never do anything revolutionary because they're always fearful of being blamed for the change. So they, so they stick with w what happens now, regardless of how bad it is. Because if they don't do anything, then they can't personally be blamed for it. If they do something, then it's all their fault. So we're in uh, this sort of this uh, this position of um, of sclerotic inaction. And if you're wondering, by the way, where all the money goes to um, uh, when uh, for students pay nine thousand pounds a term, which would put me off, and I bet it would put you off too. The people that went through university and d didn't think twice about it because it was all free. And, uh, and virtually everything about it was completely subsidised. I, mean, I, pr I probably wouldn't have gone. Why would I have gone to study psychology for crying out loud? What use is there in that? I learnt nothing at university. If I'd come out with 50 grand's worth of debt, having learnt nothing from all of my formal education, other than uh, carbon dioxide turns lime water milky, that's the only thing I ever learnt at school and university. Carbon dioxide turns lime water milky. That's the only thing I learnt. I don't even know what lime water is. <laughs> I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, know a carbon dioxide if you stuck it in my face. So to come out of uh, all of that uh, useless... Um, Lack, well, it's not studying really, it was a lack of studying, that's my problem. To have a giant cloud of debt above me, I, I probably wouldn't have done it. And I bet most of you wouldn't have done it either. That kids are being forced to, um, to rack up such uh, uh, unconscionable debts is just, uh, it's just, it's just flat out wrong. And you might wonder, well, how can they justify £9,000 a year for a course like sociology, you know, all these wishy-washy nothing subjects like uh, philosophy and psychology and all those ologies? Because all you do is you sit there for a couple of hours a week. I mean, in the last, because I did it for four years, in the last two years, I literally had about two hours of lectures a week. That was it. For the rest of the time, you were, you were supposed to go and to the library and, uh, you know, work hard on your studies. <laughs> and no one ever did. And so what on earth do they do with that money? How can they justify that amount? And the answer is that they don't have to justify that amount. And what they spend on... Uh, or they use that money to uh, to uh, spend on is uh, well this this might be illuminating an Oxford University boss who claimed that vice chancellors of universities have modest salaries compared to footballers has racked up get ready seventy thousand pounds in expenses since being appointed what? one year ago <laughs> seventy grand that's not wage, that's expenses. And of course vice-chancellors of universities have m modest salaries compared to footballers. It's a preposterous thing to say. You might as well say they have a modest salary compared to Bill Gates. They're not footballers. They're not in the entertainment racket like footballers are. You know, all of these, uh, these people used to get by on actual modest salaries. There was, this was before the uh, universities had this waterfall of cash coming through their door. You could say the exact same thing about the people that run the railways. They all used to get by on uh, what uh, an ordinary, uh, reasonable human being would call a modest salary. But as soon as the companies went private, suddenly they, they decided that they were experts in great demand and they awarded themselves fabulous pay rises. And to be fair, you and I would have done the exact same thing in the exact same position if we could have uh, got away with it. Figures obtained by the university's newspaper Cherwell revealed that Professor Louise Richardson's air travel alone, she is the uh, Vice-Chancellor of Oxford University, her air travel alone came to nearly £57,000 since January 2016. Not even Judith Chalmers flies that much. This freedom of information request showed that she claimed £10,000 on accommodation costs. 
What did she stay in a hotel or buy one? Um. Earlier in the year, the Oxford Vice Chancellor, Professor Richardson, was mocked by University's Minister Joe Johnson after claiming that vice chancellors are low paid compared to footballers and bankers. Well, she should have been blooming well mocked. A preposterous thing to say for somebody so bright. Uh, um, uh, Joe Johnson, Boris's brother, said that she should not be in her job if she wants to be paid like a footballer. Exactly. You want to be paid like a, like a footballer, be a footballer. Which she can't be because she doesn't have nearly enough tattoos and there's the whole, uh, you know, not being a man thing. Or being very good at football. <coughs> a spokesperson for Oxford University was wheeled out uh, to uh, try to bat away the press and they said that expenses all stemmed from university uh, official business. And that expenses had lessened in recent years. Lessened! Speaking to the Telegraph, a spokesperson said Oxford University uh, generates £5.8 billion for the UK economy every year, which, which sounds ever so much like, don't question us, peasant. They then said that the uh, Vice-Chancellor travels in economy class on short-haul flights and usually in standard class for train journeys. How can you spend £70,000 on economy flights in one year? You'd have to be perpetually in the air. Does she ever land? Earlier in the year, David Palfreyman, who was bursar of New College Oxford, said universities should call time on the gravy train and criticised his own institution over Vice-Chancellor pay. Quite right, too. He called the pay of Oxford senior management grossly excessive. Correct. You know, we found uh, last September uh, uh, of 114 universities, 44 of them saw the cost of Vice-Chancellor pay settlements uh, including wages and pensions and benefits, they went up 20% in five years. Did you, dear listener, get a 20% pay rise over the last five years? No. I'll assume that the answer is no. And of the 57 universities that had the same vice-chancellor in place throughout the five-year period, eight saw their pay go up by more than a third. Yes. A third! Which sounds like about 33 and a third percent to me. <laughs> And, as you would expect, of course, rank-and-file academic staff, in contrast, lost out over the same period that their bosses had to stratospheric pay rises. Well, ain't that always the case? The workers saw their salaries drop in the same period, by, in real terms, by 2.8%. The workers' salaries went down, and the bosses went through the roof. Huh. And all of this happened since the vast uh, money-making scheme, the, um, the pyramid scheme, that is charging students nine grand a term. And you might have wondered what the universities do with all that cash. Well, wonder no more. Mitch says, Germany and Norway are two of the richest countries in Europe, yet both only provide free university places for around 35% of their school leavers. If we do abolish tuition fees in this country, surely we could neither justify nor afford to keep sending nearly half of our school leavers into further education. Well, the afford part is I would question that. I mean, if we can if we write an open-ended check, I, I know I keep banging on about this, but it makes absolutely no sense to me. And uh, we, I think we've just been brainwashed into accepting this. We can write an open check, literally hundreds of billions of pounds, for a weapon system that would uh, end all life on Earth that we will never use, ever. We will never use it. Why on earth does a, a tiny um, a country off the coast of Europe need such a weapon system for a start? And, um, it, well, if, uh, if you're right in saying that Germany and Norway send, uh, give free university places to 35% of their school leavers, well, that's 35% that's more than we do. You seem to be suggesting that that is a small amount for them. That's a hell of a lot. And I don't think we need to send half of our school leavers into university. That was um, uh, Tony Blair's idea. You remember Tony Blair, don't you? No! Yeah, that's the fella. That was his uh, little scheme to send 50% of school leavers into university. Now, I've met people, 50% <laughs> of them would not benefit from uh, a, higher, uh, a, a higher formal education. They might benefit from uh, learning skills. I mean, it seems unlikely that 
uh, robots would be able to do something as uh, as fiddly and um, as site specific as plumbing, for instance, or um, in, you know electrical work or uh, tiling or roofing or you know all that sort of stuff. I mean, we need people to do that. We need we need bricklayers. I mean, I know they got robots that to do um, that do lay bricks, but they they only do it in. Uh, for they're only good at the moment for long expanses of uh, wall, you know, like the side of a warehouse or something like that. They don't do the the you know, the intricate stuff. I think the average age of a bricklayer in this country is over fifty years old now. You know, homegrown um, British bricklayers. So there's a vast skills gap that could be uh, filled by people leaving school and going to learn an actual real-life trade in which there would be a future. But going to uh, university and uh, learning to, uh, oh, you know, underwater basket weaving or whatever the hell it is that they do in these, uh, these nothing subjects, that is a waste of money. And being persuaded to go to a university just to fill some government quota just so that the Prime Minister of the day can stand up and say, look, at, under my uh, munificent leadership, look how bright we are now, all these uh, degrees. Well, they might, people might be uh, up to their eyeballs in uh, uh, qualifications, but there's not getting them anywhere. So we don't need to send half of our school leavers into further education. We need to, t to train them in some way, but not at university, perhaps. And if Germany does, uh, Germany and Norway do send 35% of their school leavers to uh, higher education for free, then um, they're the future and we're not. Redditch. Oh, Irene. Hello. Irene. Yeah. You've got the um, time thing wrong way round. A what? When, when we go, the clocks go backwards yeah. tonight. Mm-hmm. We are going back on to what is Britain's official Greenwich Mean Time. Um, the British Summer Time, which we're changing from, yeah. is the one that was brought in to help the farmers. Yeah, but why why do we have to go back to uh, Greenwich Mean Time? Who's Cause that's what that's the one we should be on. That's the one that the uh, the timelines and everything are set on. Yeah, but that's, but that's only but that's, help, but that's only for the benefit. That's, that's only for the benefit of sailors uh, to navigate Greenwich Mean Time. Why do that's, Why do the rest of us have to? The why, original, that's, why that's I don't the care. Just because it was we the we <laughs> just because it was the original one, Irene, doesn't make it right. But you're saying that it was done for the farmers. It wasn't British Summer Time was done for the farmers. It was done during the war to introduce. It uh, increased productivity when we were getting all our own food. Yeah, and we should stick there. We, in fact, we should double. Well, we should double you. down, <laughs> and we should go. I agree eat. with you. I'm just saying you've got it the wrong way round. No, I don't think so, Irene. <laughs> I know you have. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm a farmer's uh, daughter, I know the way it works. Right. Well, I don't care about farmers. You know what? The thing with the, <laughs> no, I don't. The thing with cows is they don't know what time it is. They still want milking when the light uh, when it gets uh, light. So it makes absolutely That's no right. difference to cows right. what the actual clock says. Yeah, but the thing is, if it, if if, if um, they're waking up earlier in the morning, they can be milked earlier. Well, they'll just have to stand they, around. As you say, they, w they wake up when it's Yeah, daylight. exactly. They wake up when the yeah. cock crows. <laughs> and the cock ain't looking at the clock either. No, he wakes up when it's daylight as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's just insufferable. I mean, it's just going to be so depressing. I mean, already I want to spend all day in bed just because there's so little light oh, now. I know. Anyway, I know. You just go yeah, into sort of hibernation mode, don't you? But it's going to be it's dark at four thirty, Irene. I can't stand it. <laughs> and all we got to look forward to is uh, Christmas. When it's spring and it all goes longer again. Yeah, which is which is going to be at least six months away. And then we've got yeah. to wait at least another three months before the weather gets nice. So it's going to be a yeah. an, an nine months of hell. <laughs> <laughs> you are very careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm t t just telling the truth. I'm just telling it like it is, Irene. All yeah. right. Thanks All a right. lot. Cheers, mate. I think that uh, Irene and I can uh, both agree that I'm completely correct in every respect. 
Uh, Gary says, happy for my taxes to be used to fund free university education in sciences, medicine and engineering. But if someone wants their three-year jolly studying the history of art, which is essentially just an indulgence of an interest resulting in no meaningful qualification, then in my view they are going to have to fund that course themselves. Well, but there's something to be said for that. I mean, we do need people with uh, knowledge of art, because art is a is a significant part of uh, our lives, whether you actually go to, a, you know, uh, to a galleries or not. And if you don't, then you should. I mean, let's not dismiss uh, the, uh, the, the joys in life. Life isn't just work. And if we're going to have uh, museums and galleries and, uh, you know, a, a, a healthy and vibrant uh, art scene in this country, which we should, it's very important, then uh, we need people with uh, some uh, learning in that uh, regard. So maybe the history of art is uh, is not the best subject to pick to uh, heap your opprobrium on, but I, I do understand what you mean. I mean, if, if our uh, directly competing countries like France and Germany and uh, Spain and Italy and all the rest, if they can afford free or heavily subsidized education, if they make our system look ridiculously expensive, then I'm, I'm willing to uh, hazard that they're getting it right and we're getting it wrong. We seem to be following the American system. I just don't get it. I mean, Donald Trump isn't going to be pleased with us uh, whether we follow him or not. Donald Trump is not a nice person. Donald Trump is not a nice person. Oh, I haven't got to the letter yet. I've only got 15 minutes to go. I'm going to... Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read the letter in a minute. Um, oh, John says, don't forget to talk about that thing you keep forgetting to talk about. <laughs> yeah. I'll remember. Don't you forget about... Uh, don't you worry about that. Is calling Kingston, Omar. Thank you, your genius. Omar. You're a genius. I, th I, th I, th I think you must have called the wrong show. I'm a genius. You're a genius. Well, um, you're pretty wrong about the electric cars. I don't think electric cars will reduce that much pollution if energy is still produced using coal. So you need to coal. Who coal? Nobody wants to use coal to produce uh, energy. We went coal free for the first time ever. Uh, on uh, the, for our, uh, our daily diet of uh, energy uh, the other uh, week, and uh, we can certainly get a, a you know, fashion a coal-free future. Don't listen to Donald Trump. There's no such thing as clean coal. There's still a big uh, coal uh, power station in the Thames Estuary. Well, well, but then we should get rid of it as soon as possible. Nuclear, the nuclear deterrent is going to be rendered. Um, I'm working though, um, it will have in about 10 years, that the Americans are working on them, like um, an electromagnetic gun which can shoot, um, I think, ballistic objects out of it coming in, so if you have to try them, it won't, won't work anyway, so there's no point having it, so you are a genius. You're well, they, they said this about Star Wars, didn't they? The, not, not the film, about the, uh, the Star Wars defence capability. You remember uh, uh, Ronnie Reagan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, yeah. was uh, dead, dead keen on that. And, and the thing about all of that, uh, you know, shooting a rocket out of the sky stuff is uh, it probably won't work. No, dear, it's like, uh, you know, because they're developing an electromagnetic gun. Yeah. They're working on it so you can uh, shoot projectiles at a very fast speed. Uh, faster than, uh, three times faster than anything. Well, they're probably also working on tiny little nanobots that fly, and uh, you know, like um, like um, mosquitoes. And there'll be billions and trillions of them, and they'll just to set them on uh, the country of their choice, and they will fly up your nose, Omar, and s and scramble your brain like a food processor. That's what really happened to me. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that you called right. me oh. first. <laughs> read that letter. Read that letter. Go to the Trump thing. Oh, the letter Quite thing. Yeah, okay. Oh, don't worry. I've got plenty of time before the end of the show. Don't, don't you worry about that. All right. Thanks a lot, Omar. Nuclear weapons are a complete waste of money. And it's not a little uh, amount of money. It is a staggering amount of money. And you know what? When they press the big uh, green button mark go, they probably won't work. I mean, who would be remotely surprised if that came to pass? This great uh, feat of mechanical engineering, uh, they'll say, oh, 
yeah sorry about that i forgot to uh yeah uh, to uh, plug it in it'll be something and why would we want it to work anyway what's it for why does a tiny a uh, uh, little uh, in relatively insignificant uh, tax haven off the coast of europe need nuclear blooming weapons uh, but particularly as our uh, health uh, service is uh, turning away people who are going blind and can't walk. They're, uh, they're actually asking people to give up a room in their house because we don't have enough beds in hospitals. The flu season hasn't even started yet, and you've got hospitals uh, who are um, uh, sounding the uh, alert because they won't be able to cope when it does. Warning! Warning! Don't get sick! Cover rack. Where's that, Tom? Yeah, good evening, Nick. Where's cover rack? Uh, cover rack is the southeast coast of the Lizard Peninsula, far southwest UK. Can you smell that smell? I can't, but well, funny enough, I could smell uh, last night on. Um, I'm a gardener by trade, by the way, Nick. Oh, yes. Uh, and driving back last night, I did get a very strong scent mm -hmm. of rotten cabbages. Yeah, well, that would be your uh, occupation. Well, no, it was a field next door. They had a load of cabbages. Rotten cabbages, yeah, well, that would be yeah, it. Yeah, but uh, that did come in strong. But, uh, <laughs> uh, no, we didn't get that plasticky uh, smell. That's an intriguing situation up there. Yeah, unpleasant. Yeah, very unpleasant. Uh, what I'm bringing in about there, Mick, is... Uh, mm -hmm. Nick, is um, I, I, I was a bit uh, taken aback by your um, uh, thing about leaf blowers. Yes. Now, Hate I'm uh, a gardener them. by trade, and I do um, use uh, said leaf blower. Oh. No! Yeah, you're part of the problem, Tom, not the solution. No, I find it extraordinary. It completely cuts the time I used to scratch around. Yeah, well, I don't care. Just buy a rake, mate. No, a rake would take you to eternity. Well, I don't care. It would also be quiet while you're uh, t while you're working for an eternity. <laughs> They're the worst sounding things on earth. Leaf blowers. I hate them. Nick, in the right hands, they are a boom. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, they just sound like a sonic boom, a continuous sonic boom. They are awful. Nothing sounds as bad. I can understand, Nick, but there are people out there yeah. that will direct their blow to shift a leaf six inches. Yeah. I, I do get that. You, you got there people. Are, you got used. people coming around from the council, or people who uh, work, uh, you know, b blocks of flats and so on, and they and they go around in the uh, trying to blow litter and leaves around that are soaking wet that don't move, and they'll be out there for hours and hours and hours trying to m move a leaf a foot. They could just pick them up individually, and put them in an envelope and post them to the dump. I totally agree with you, but uh, like I say. Uh, with my experience on cutting many hedges, yes, and um, you know, um, I'm in a stuff. coastal region here, and the growth is very intense. So let me ask you this, you yes. uh, expert gardener, you: when do you put in uh, Jersey lilies? Because I quite like the idea of something that flowers around this time of year. Jersey lilies stick them in any time of the year. There, Nick. That seems very vague. That doesn't sound like any ex any manner of expertise at all, Tom. That's just a case of experience of when you're in a condition in here in Gornball, yeah. our climate, you can do anything at any time. Right. They, they, you throw the book out the window, Nick. <laughs> Being subtropical, we have the subtropical uh, vibrations. Wow. You've got subtropical vibrations going on down there. Groovy. Sounds like an excellent place to be, uh, Tom. It is indeed, Nick. Right. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot, um, and uh, stop smoking that vegetation. All right. So you can do anything you want in Cornwall. Yowza. I had no idea. It sounds like a place to go, don't it? Just as long as uh, you don't see um, our uh, ex-Prime Minister David Cameron with his shirt off on the beach. <coughs> where children can see him. Claire says, I know people who went to university to study law after their first year they dropped out as it was too much reading and found it boring. So they're working in retail. 
All lawyers are about to get fired by robots. And Josh says, degrees in art, outrageous. Before you know it, there'll be art student graduates making multi-million pound dollars, multi-million dollars grossing art house movies. Making multi-million dollars grossing art house movies. Or something like that. I think you get the idea. So there's this uh, letter that to Donald Trump. Um, well, a letter allegedly written by Donald Trump's secretary in 1992 has been unearthed by uh, the, uh, the magazine called New York. And they uh, printed it along with a lot of other uh, letters to celebrate their 50th anniversary. They're 50 years old. They made it. Not many publications can say that. And it's rebutting an article that apparently suggested that Donald Trump does not treat women well, which was written by a journalist called Julie Baumgold. And the letter was signed by somebody who is supposedly Donald Trump's secretary called Carolyn Gallego. Now, a lot of publications have tried to find Carolyn Gallego, but they have discovered that, uh, that she cannot be found. She apparently does not exist. Now, <laughs> you tell me who this sounds like uh, wrote this letter. Now, remember that it's uh, 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 rebutting an article which is apparently written by a journalist called Julie Baumgold in a publication that suggested that Donald Trump doesn't treat women well. And the letter reads, Based on the fact that I work for Donald Trump as his secretary, and therefore know him well, I think he treats women with great respect. Contrary to what Julie Baumgold implied in her article, I don't believe any man in America gets more calls from women wanting to see him, meet him, or go out with him. The most beautiful women, the most successful women, all women love Donald Trump. You are going to love President Trump. It sounds a little like Donald Trump wrote that to me. It sounds that if Donald Trump had written an article about his attractiveness to women, that is exactly what he would have written. He's not that smart. Trust me, I'm like a smart person. Once again, I stand corrected. Who knows what might happen between now and the next Friday at 10 o'clock? Those uh, Russian revelations uh, may pop open on Monday. Isn't it exciting? Yes. Yeah. All eyes on Washington. Uh, but don't take your eyes off uh, the EU or uh, the sex scandal in the Palace of Westminster. Or just this, this overwhelming amount of news. It's just too much news. And we'll be chewing it up and spitting it out when we get uh, back together on Friday and Saturday at 10 o'clock. <coughs> Until then.